gathered, tonight's guest needs absolutely no introduction. But before we get to the great Sean Thompson, we've got a segment with Dean Allen, a historian who I'm sure you've all heard of. He's going to be doing a, a segment on the Cape Receive Lighthouse. <laughs> Hello, it's Dean Allen here, and I'm at the Cape Reef Nature Reserve, and I'm about to climb that 24-metre building you can see in front. In fact, that lighthouse has a total of 87 steps, so here we go. Wow, here I am at the top of the Cape Reef Lighthouse. Uh, this amazing structure, which is part of the Port Elizabeth landscape, of course, marks the southernmost part of Algoa Bay. And this lamp that you can see here at the top of the light lamp, uh, lighthouse, would you believe, has a candle power of 4 million. It can reach 29 nautical miles out to sea, which is quite incredible. So this lighthouse, uh, which was built in 1849, has been protecting shipping in this area for generations. It's quite amazing. In fact, this area out here to sea is known as Thunderbolt Reef due to the fact that uh, HMS Thunderbolt got shipwrecked here. So of course there was a need for a lighthouse like this. And as you can see here, this incredible structure which will be lit up as we speak, protects the shipping in this area of the Eastern Cape.
Thank you, Dean. Okay, um, just before we continue, a big thank you and a shout out to Amobia, to Fat Cats, to Fitch and Leeds, and to Spa for sponsoring the shows. Thank you very much. Very kind of you. Okay, we're going to cross over to Sean Thompson. As I said earlier, he needs very little, if any, introduction. But to put it simply, he's been voted the top 25 most influential surfers ever, the top 10 greatest ever, and a world champion in 1977. And I, I would think if I had to sit here the whole evening and write down his, or if I had to write down his accolades, it would take the whole evening. So let's bring the great Sean Thompson. Sean, <laughs> welcome to the show. Hey guys, it's great. To, it's great to be there. And I've missed coming back to South Africa, but I'm going to be there for a couple of weeks in August. Looking forward to uh, looking forward to that. So just around the corner, and it's great to chat to you guys. Well, when you come here in August, you can come and get your pineapple jacket uh, from Almalia. <laughs> you look nice, Jaber, in that jacket. I want that pineapple jacket from Gina the Jola. I want it. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, we've got a full show tonight, so if you don't mind, we're going to cut to the chase. Um, what we'd like to do is start off with you as a young guy. And, and obviously the road or journey to becoming a world champion could not have been an easy road. Tell us a little bit about yourself as a young guy. <laughs> well, I grew up in Durban. My mom and dad uh, were beach people. They loved the beach. My dad was a champion swimmer. Uh, he was, uh, his dream was to go and, and swim in the Olympics, but was very badly attacked by a shark while surfing. I think it's the first recorded incident in South Africa of an attack on a surfer. <clears throat> so that destroyed his dreams, but he never lost his love for the ocean. And, you know, all, all my earliest memories of being down at the beach with my mom and dad, my mom would pack a big hamper of food and we'd sit right on the beach between Bay of Plenty and North Beach. My mom loved the ocean. She grew up on the island of Malta during the Second World War. It was very heavily bombed. It was the most heavily bombed place in the history of the world. 3,600 air raids. And she was eventually evacuated down to, um, and ended up in Durban. And she walked down, she told me she walked down to West Street and saw the Indian Ocean and said, I've never felt as free as when I've been at the sea. I mean, beautiful words. Yeah, I'm not going back to Malta in a rush. Yeah, I'm not and, going and back Sean, to Malta in a rush. But, uh, yeah. but she, yeah, so that was our life. We were just on the beach every single, uh, every single weekend. I started swimming. My dad taught me how to body surf when I was about uh, four years old. And uh, then it was on little surfer planes. You were like these rubber inflatable mats. And then I went on to a little uh, wetland surf master pop out. Uh, it was called the body board, but we used to use it to stand on. And then uh, I got my first board in 65. And, and then, you know, I was stoked the whole time. The very first time I ever stood up on a wave at the Bay of Plenty, I was stoked. And I've been stoked ever since. And that was about 349 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> And tell me now, as a, as a young guy, were you, um, were you fiercely competitive um, and driven? I think I was, very, I was very competitive. I played a lot of sports at school. Uh, not very well, but I was pretty enthusiastic. You know, rugby, cricket, tennis. I was swimming. Uh, I was a swimming captain, of course. I was at a Jewish school, so not such good swimmers there. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, I, loved, I loved sport. I loved competing. My dad had been a competitor in his youth. And I just loved surfing. And then the competitive aspect started up. I was actually, I like to think I was an instant success. I got a, I got a third in my very first surfing event at the Bay of Plenty. There was only three of us, but I got my third. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you if it came naturally to you. Yeah, yeah. A third out of three was a good start. But I always thought of it as third and not last. So I suppose my <laughs> even at a young age was um, I think was was important. You know, I always looked at athletics and surfing and competition. Uh, if you lost, it was never a, a career ender. Or it was never depression. It was just like move on, forget about it, and then uh, move on to the next one. But I loved surfing so much. I naturally, uh, I think. Progressed. We had a group of guys at the Bay of Plenty who were all unbelievable surfers, all world class. So we used to have a lot of fun in the lineup, but we used to be fiercely competitive with each other. My dad <clears throat> would stand on the beach with binoculars and watch everyone. And when everyone came in, he would like give them a comment. So everyone knew that my dad was watching them. So it was like yeah. 
Montana, even though we were having fun, we were all going out very, very hard at every single session. Yeah. And Sean, just as a matter of interest, who were some of those guys in the lineup in, in those early days of your uh, surfing? Well, there was Mike Thompson, who, uh, other than me, uh, I think, uh, and Jordy is the only person to win a major uh, a world ranked professional event. He actually was ranked number five in the world in 1976, my cousin Michael. And, you know, we surfed all the time together. My brother Paul uh, also, you know, was surfing with us, Bruce Jackson, Kevin Todd. Uh, Paul Nordee, the Richards brothers, Jeremy Yates, the Yates brothers. So, so we, um, Michael Esposito was fantastic. We just had yes. this this group of guys that were, um, how oh, they were stoked, they were competitive, and, and we yeah. just we had so much fun. You know, it, it was a uh, the Bay of Plenty was this it was the center of surfing in in, in South Africa and perhaps one of the centers of surfing in the world during the 70s. Yes. And Sean, going back or 10 years prior to that, when you started out, who were the main guys in the water then? And who were your role models? Well, then it was, um, it was <coughs> Bob Moore era. So surfing really changed radically in uh, 1968. Surfboards went from like nine foot long surfboards with the long boards down to, I went from like a, uh, eight foot eight surfboard down to a, a five foot six surfboard in about <clears throat> two weeks. But my hero, my, my big South African hero was a guy called George Thompson. He's, he's now George Thermopolis. Yes. But he, he was, he was the greatest. Mm. Then there was Max Whitman, Robbie McWay, Errol Hickman. Uh, you know, there, there was definitely amazingly talented uh, surfers, but, but to me, uh, George Thompson was my hero. Yeah, yeah, great surfer. I remember seeing a lot of pictures of him when we were kids. And Sean, now, you, you obviously, there must have been a pecking order in the water. And at what sort of point in time in, your, in those early days were you allowed into that pecking order? Or were the guys quite cool with you? Did they give you waves? Did they allow you to get waves? Or were you sort of kept at bay? Yeah, no, we developed and we invented the pecking order at the Bay of Plenty. Even when we were very young, when we were like, 13 from 13 onwards i would say we started getting getting pretty good we had it was we had a rule out there you had to wait your turn for a wave and there were some tough guys out in the lineup and if anyone jumped the queue jumped the line they'd just get a flat end so <laughs> it, it, it was like gentlemen's rules out there you know even though yeah. certain out of culture and wild and it was still at the Bay of Plenty. It was very, very well established. And you waited your turn. You got your way. This was amongst the, you know, dozen guys that were, that were really good. Um, yes. You, you know, people that were sort of learning were more down on the on the shoulder. But everyone understood. You know what I mean? You, you just waited your turn, and then it was your way. Yeah. Um, Sandy, I, I do apologize. I forgot to mention that you're co-hosting. It's been a real test of technology, by the way. Sandy's no sitting in Durban, Sean's in California, Spider's in Durban, Peter Townsend is, I think, in your neck of the woods, is he not, Sean? Wow, yeah, he's in California. <laughs> yeah, and then Derek's in Australia. So, Sandy, welcome. I do apologize for not introducing no, you in the apologize. beginning. I'm listening about who was in the water, George Thompson, and all those. Uh, I want to know, why did he change his surname? Good question. Yeah, well, he was, uh, he was of Greek ethnicity. And I think, uh, you know, he just wanted to reconnect with his cultural heritage. You know, a lot of people, when they came down, <coughs> you know, uh, 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 our grandparents, when they came down to like South Africa, they changed their name. Like our family name was Tom Shinsky. And they changed it to Thompson. And I'm not going back to Tom Shinsky. So, so George, you know, was Thermopolis and thought, you know, he's going to go back to Thermopolis. <laughs> no, no, but no, you've got... Carry on. I beg your pardon? Are you, are you going to cover um, about the book? No, no, I was, I was going to ask, uh, basically, I mean, to give it some context, I mean, you've known Sean for some time. Well, not, I mean, Sean's been a very big supporter of disabled surfing, adaptive surfing in South Africa. <laughs> and, um, and I, I mean, I, I would, I, I've had lunch with Sean, that's the thing that I can say. And he's just been amazing for the, the and I, it's a pun intended the movement of disabled surfing uh, surfing in south africa so i mean yes. 
he's i don't know if any of you know it but um adaptive surfing it's now called para surfing i think it's changed i don't know sean maybe you know um but in so uh, the isa the international surfing association introduced adaptive surfing about seven or eight years ago and my younger brother is um, an adaptive surfer um he 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 gets a bit embarrassed that he's an adaptive surfer because he only has a paralyzed arm um and in adaptive surfing there are five divisions and the most challenging of which is um the blind division now you can imagine yeah they've never seen uh, people before but anyway that's that's a different story but sean we needed to get the south african team over to la Jolla to the first world champs and sean very very generously donated us a surfboard we raffled it we got money he came to the beach he's been to the beach every single time south africa has been on that beach over the five or six years yes. um and he's been there rallying for us and indeed was on the beach when my brother won a gold medal and i thought this is the time to bring anthony in you've got the picture you've got uh, we've yeah, got a picture, yeah. a picture of it yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Um, so, we'll find the picture so, so just to say that we're deeply, deeply grateful, Sean. I mean, you do a lot of outreach stuff. I know you're a very busy guy, but you've given um, us such a big part of your heart. Uh, and, um, and we've- I love you know, it, I love doing it. Yeah, yeah I, know. Many, many I know, I know. Just ask um, Gary if Anthony's ready, because he's got a great story to tell. Um, is Anthony on? I see he's, he is on, yeah? Yeah. And yeah. can you hear us? Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm very hey, good. Thanks. We got, we got your mentor here. <laughs> I know. Look at that. <laughs> We've actually got a picture of the two of you as well. How are you doing, Ant? Yeah, I'm good. You Thank wanna you. Have, you want to have a wrap to Sean? Well, yeah, what, actually, what I want to do is ask Anthony to... Um, Anthony had a car accident when he was four or five years old. We can never quite okay. remember. Um, and But I want him to tell you the story of Sean. There you go. And all yours. Okay. So when I was five, it was five, not six, I had a car accident uh, and it left me paralyzed. So I have an arm that, that uh, doesn't work. Um, and uh, I started surfing because the doctors said to my parents that I should try, they should get me a surfboard so that it would force me to try and use my right arm. Um, which they did, and, and clearly it didn't work because I still paddled with one arm. But what did happen was I got hooked into surfing. And every other surfer on the planet, it's a, you know, the bug bites, it becomes a lifestyle, not a sport. And, um, and you just want to get better as a surfer and surf often. And uh, I was seven years old, and I, I had an old Lamont single fin. Um, and I would... Uh, put it on my bed, and I think most, you know, the young kids do this these days with the fin off the back of the board, and pretend I was surfing on on the board. But on the wall in front of me, there was a picture, um, and I think it was Jerry Lopez. It was a point of view shot where um, the camera is behind him on the surfboard. You could see his feet, and he was in a barrel, and you could see the barrel, you know, kind of going over him. And I would stand on my board and. And pretend that was me, you know, surfing on this wave. Funny. And then I would also regularly lie in bed. It was 1977 when Sean became world champ. And I would literally kneel down and pray that I could be world champion surfer like Sean Thompson. I would say those words. And then obviously, nice. you know, you get older and, and um, you know, you're not good enough. And the dream gets lost because maybe you're disabled or, or you know, you you. You, you're not good enough and, and you don't win contests. And then Adaptive Surfing came around in 2015. And this uh, Robin de Kock from Surfing South Africa called me and said, would you like to go and surf, you know, and, and compete for South Africa? And of course I was in. And we reached out to Sean that year to to come and give us, um, uh, cap us, give us our, our blazers. And he met us on the beach. Um, and, and Sean, by the way, that, that, that your presence there, you know, not only for our team, but for the whole adaptive community was remarkable. I mean, people were lining up to take photos with you. The bug, the, you know, it was so, we were so proud that, that, that you were one of us, you know, on the beach. It was a real, real special uh, experience for everybody. Oh, there's the shot. That was actually the, I think that was the following year. So to end the story, um, 
you know, 40 years later, after me praying to God to be world champion like Sean Thompson, I ended up winning the world title and becoming a world champion. And Sean Thompson was on the beach there to celebrate Fantastic. with me watching. There you go. So that's, there's a story for you. Great, great stuff, man. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, there you go. There is with the whole team. I mean, awesome. I can't tell you yeah. how amazing it was. So thank you, Sean, from us. Oh, love it. Love it. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. And thank so you, Ant. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Bring Sean, going back, back to going back to your career now. We're still in the the young or the the early stages. Your first contest as a junior. Do you have any memories of it? Yeah, so my very first contest <clears throat> was the, the the boys' division of the Bay Surf Club. That's the one where I came third out of three. It was won by Jeremy Yates, my cousin Michael second, and I was third. Third, not last, but third. <laughs> and then I think the first major competition I won was uh, SA Boys' Championship in 1969. Wow, that is so so long ago and that was at uh that was at jeffrey's bay can you like jeffrey's bay which has become sort of synonymous with my um with my surfing so yeah that was my first biggest <clears throat> biggest win and then I, I remember i won it three times in a row uh the junior championships and then you know won the, the senior championships so i was we we had this uh my father was and graham hines peter Benes. They were very instrumental in having a lot of a lot of amateur contests in Durban. So it was called the monthly. And every month the Mattel Surfing Association would have a surfing competition. So every month, and it was mobile, it would go up the north coast, down the south coast, or around Durban. And and we'd have these monthly contests. So what it would do, it would create this intense competition, but also it would expose the best surfers to all these different spots and to the young kids yeah. that went to these different spots. So it, it was yeah. just amazing. Uh, I think it had a lot to do with uh, my competitive success because I learned how to compete as well. Every month I was in the water against all these guys my age and a little bit older and a little bit younger who were all world class. And we were having a lot of fun traveling to a different place. And, uh, you know, I, I think I learned that competition wasn't all about practice. Competition yes. was about having fun and being stoked, and yeah. uh, that's yeah. how uh, that's how we we saw it. And then if you lost, well, you had another chance the next month. So it was never uh, it was never a, a life and death. My, and my father, I think, was a fundamental influence on like how you deal with competition. He would say to me, "Never ever complain after a result, because surfing is subjectively judged." You know, there's yes. this objectivity in terms of, well, is it a 7.5 or is it a 7.8? He would say, never complain about the judge's decision. He said, that judge's decision, it's it's engraved in stone. You can cry, you can whine, you can whinge. It's not going to change it. He said, when, he used sure. to say, when you win, win like a gentleman. And when you lose, lose like a man. Uh, this, has yeah. no, this has no sort of sexist connotation. Yeah, yeah. When you lose, you've got to just shoulder that loss and, yes. and have, a, have this this sort of champion mindset that it's not going to impact you and you're going to go on to... Yeah, to come back again. And leave the loss behind and move forward. Because that if you carry that loss on your shoulders, you will never, ever be a winner the next time. Sean, you, you often, in, in many of the interviews I've heard you on, you often refer to your dad and, you know, if I may say, and I, I'm sure I speak for many here, if there's one thing that's endeared you to many, many people, it's the incredible love and respect and admiration you showed for your dad. And, I mean, we've touched on him this evening, but he must have been a remarkable man. He was a remarkable man. And all of us, I think every single man out there, that is our greatest role in life, is, yes. is, is how to be a good dad. And, you know, we all try... Um, but I'll, I'll tell you the key, I think, from, from seeing, you know, my relationship and seeing a lot of great relationships and seeing a lot of bad relationships is time. 
My dad gave us so much of his time. If I was playing a rugger match, he would come down and watch. If, yeah. you know, we would go on surfing trips, uh, the whole family together. And my mom was the same way. She, she also tried to give us as much of her time um, as possible. And I think both of them had a lot of um, <clears throat> respect um, and trusted us. And yes. I think as a young guy, when you know your parents trust you, <clears throat> you know you don't want to disappoint them. You want to do, you want to do the right thing. Sure. And, and also, uh, I've got to tell you this funny story. So, my dad had an unbelievable sense of humor. He loved to be around young people. He loved to be laughing and joking all the time. I mean, if, if you were in a conversation with my dad and there was like a group of you, and, you know, him and me might be standing around with a drink in the hand, he, he, he'd stand on the, the foot of the person next to him and make out <laughs> like he didn't know he was doing it. But he, <laughs> everyone else knew. Only the person whose foot was being stood on didn't know. And, and, and the, the guy would sort of, you know, he'd look around at everyone. And everyone would know exactly. And people eventually would be shrieking with laughter. But the very first time I um, I won a major pro event, so the Gunston 500, you know, it was such a legendary, legendary event. So I was doing my, my national service. I was 17 years old. And I, I made the final against all these great surfers. And it was close final between me and a guy called Mike Esposito, just an amazing, yes. amazing surfer uh, from Durban. Goofy footer. Goofy for that, absolutely incredible, incredible server. One of the greatest South African servers of all time. So it was a close final, and uh, they had this big tower. They called the Gunston Tower, big orange tower with you know men red, Gunston grey. And my dad yeah. was in the tower, and what he was, he was a spotter. So he'd stand there with his binoculars, and he'd shout out a color: yellow up, red up, blue up. So I knew that he he knew the results because all the judges were together and you know they wanted to have this whole anticipation so the six finalists were up on the podium and there was tens of thousands of people and they started announcing the results and i knew it was going to be close so i look up at my dad just before they announce result and i go like you know like how have i done and he goes like <laughs> he goes, my dad oh, goes like, this. I go, oh, what a bummer I, you know i've lost them it was my first big chance so they start announcing the results, third, second. And as they say second, I start walking up and they say, and the winner is Sean Thompson. And, <laughs> I, I, and I looked up at my dad. My dad was cracking up. Practical my, joker. You know, just at sort of the, the high point of my, of my, my sort of, of my commencing career, he's, he's played this joke on me. And, you know, I've thought about that a, a lot over the years, like about a dad doing that to a son. And you know, there's a fundamental lesson there, I think, that um, competition's important. Yeah. But it's that answer. important. It's not yeah. that important. Um, and I think over the years, it's really helped me put winning and losing in perspective. You know, that moment yes. with my special moment with my dad and him giving me the thumbs down. And, it's not that important, you know what I mean? You get all yeah. he wanted me to do was do my best. He never ever came in when I came in from a heat and I'd lost or I'd made a screw up in the lineup and perhaps waited too long or caught the, the wrong way. He would never ever lecture me ever in my entire yeah. career. And he would never tell me what sure. to do in the lineup as well, ever. He left yeah. it all up to me. So I knew. I wanted to win for him and I wanted to win for my mom. I wanted to win for them. But I had the responsibility. And yes, yes. I was winning. Yes, I was winning for, for the family and for me. But it, it it wasn't like I had this father who was obsessed yeah. with uh, his son winning. My yes. father was obsessed with his son doing the best he could and being the best he could. Yeah. Giving it his best shot. The winning wasn't the winning wasn't the essential part of the equation. The winning just represented the result of the yeah. hard work and the effort and and, and, and having that uh, personal responsibility. So it, it, it was very cool. So I, I used to play the same joke on my dad. So yeah. when I won my first event 
in South Africa, uh, in, in, in Hawaii. So it was massive surf. I was a complete outsider. Surf was like 15 feet at Sunset Beach. It was the biggest prize money in the world at the time, like five and a half thousand dollars. And I won a motorbike. Anyway, so I phoned my dad up and go, hey dad, how's it going after the result? Because he always would be, he knew when it was on and he, yeah. uh, how'd you go? Uh, I, I did okay. Well, how'd you go? I oh, know I won. <laughs> <laughs> Get him back. <laughs> um, can, since we're talking about parenting, can we chat a little bit about Matthew and Luke? Yes, I have a, uh, <clears throat> so I have a beautiful son. Uh, now I'm my son Luke, uh, his name, uh, his name means light and healer. And, and certainly he has been a light and a, and a healer. He's 12 years old now. And he's in London at the moment on, on, on vacation with Carla. I'm going over next week. <laughs> and then our first boy was, was Matthew. And we lost our first boy um, to a bad choice. He played a dangerous game. Uh, we believe that he heard about it at, um, at school called the choking game. All, all the students wore school ties. Uh, it was at my old school. And, um, you know, we lost, we lost our beautiful son. So that really took my life down a different path. And, um, you know, after that, um, I just kind of reevaluated uh, where I'd been and, and, and where I was going. And um, I just went down a completely unexpected path of now um, inspiring and empowering people uh, to find their fundamental purpose in life as a way, essentially, um, to make better choices. Uh, so I went back to, to, to graduate school. I'd done my BCom at, uh, at uh, Natal University, at KwaZulu Natal University. Um, so I went, I went to, uh, I did a Master of Science uh, in, in, in the study of influence and inspiration. Now they call it leadership. Um, and I started doing, uh, you know, writing books and, and doing these large events and speaking engagements to the biggest and hottest corporations in the world and schools and universities and rehab clinics and PTSD survivors and jails. Um, I, I do this thing, I call it the double shaka. So if, if you're a surfer, you know that that's like, how's it? Um, yeah. How's it my brew? And <laughs> also it's, a, it's, 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 it's just a, a very, I think it's a very beautiful gesture of goodwill. So every time I do a paid speaking engagement, I do one free for a nonprofit. You know, it might be a school, university, w w whatever, PTSD survivors, jails. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and that's the way I, 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 I run my life now, the double shaka process. So, um, yeah. I'm sure know, do, you, do you think that um, that was a direct result of having the trauma of losing Matthew, that that would have changed the whole trajectory of your life? Yeah, I, I think it, it, it certainly changed my life trajectory. I, I, I came to understand that, um, you know, no one, no one wants suffering, but suffering is inevitable. You know, we're going we're gonna to lose our, our parents, um, friends. Please, God, you know, parents don't lose children. But, you know, with this suffering uh, comes this, this terrible realization that, <clears throat> that, you know, life is short. Um, and you better make it count because you just don't know when it's going to stop. Um, yeah. and, and you might as well be kind and live a good life and, and, and try to be the best you can be, but try to help others be the best you can be. And, and um, I started realizing this when, you know, after I lost my beautiful, after we lost our beautiful son, and I started speaking um, at groups to hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and I would get them, it's called writing your code. It's, it's this amazing transformational process and, and hundreds of thousands of people have done it. I'm actually going on a TV show in, um, in a few days, like one of the biggest TV shows here to talk about, to talk oh. about this process here in the United States. <clears throat> because it's, I like to say it's open source code. And this simple process can can impact life 
immediately, I mean, I get letters back from people. I lost 50 pounds as a result of doing the code. It's like my North Star. My life has changed. My relationship with my son is better. My life is better. <clears throat> and it's so simple. You just write, pick up a sheet of paper, and in 15 minutes, you write 12 lines, every line beginning with I will. This is your code. This is your purpose. And, and what happens is <clears throat> when you define your purpose this way, many academic studies on this, this process of how to find your purpose. There's a lot about purpose, but there's nothing about how to find your purpose. Nothing. And this is a simple way to find your purpose. Twelve lines. Every line begins with that. Well, <clears throat> so what happens if you if you are imbued with a sense of purpose? What the academic studies have revealed, you're going to live twice as long. I mean, how about that? You're going to have a higher level of motivation. You're going to um, have a higher higher levels of well-being. And then, from a business perspective. Uh, businesses that are led by people of purpose perform 42% better than wow. businesses that are are, 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 are are just in business to be in business. So it has these fundamental effects. No one really knows about this. So, so this has been my mission, to create a positive wave of purpose around the world. And for me, it all came from surfing. I wrote my first code. I called it Surfer's Code, 12 lines. Yeah. And I'm beginning with my will and... And, and, and hundreds of thousands of people have read that little code. I will always paddle back out. Yeah. I'll turn my back on the Yeah, Yeah, so, so that it all came from a little code that I gave to kids. So you yeah. just know I mean, the direction and, of life. And then just um, tell me about Luke a bit. What sort of guy is he? Oh, my son is a beautiful boy. He, um, I haven't been able to get him stoked on surfing. Uh, he plays tennis. He's athletic. He's, he'll be, I think he's going to be taller than me. Um, <clears throat> but he's kind. He's loving. Um, he's just beautiful and he's just perfect. I just spoke to him on the phone while he's in London. It's just, you know, it, it's such a blessing for me because after we lost our boy, after we lost Matthew, you know, we didn't think we'd be parents again because we were older. Yeah. Um, but, it, but but he's just uh, every and day. And his name is Light, eh? Luke yeah, his name, is Light. Is, his name means yeah. healing, bringer of light. So, so, so every day, if he comes or goes, I kiss him, but I have to kiss him three times. He knows that. He's a child. And, and I go, I love you. I love you more. I love you more than anything else in the whole wide world. He's going to get that forever. And I love doing it. <laughs> You know, interestingly enough, if I may come in here, we noticed the other day, and, you know, obviously we've spoken about the love and respect you had for your dad, and I'm sure your mom as well, but one thing that was very noticeable the other day was when you and Paul were on screen, when you started talking, he had his arm around you, and I thought that was absolutely fantastic, and at one stage I think he was massaging your shoulder, <laughs> and then I saw a, I saw a message um, that your sister had put on Paul's Facebook page, um, Speaking of all, or where she wrote, I love my brothers so much. You know, and I think that's a fantastic quality. And in fact, <laughs> on that note, we're going to... I'll tell you what, I've got, to, I've, yeah. got to, I've got to interrupt you there for one second. So, sure. that's incredibly perceptive of you. Now, now that, that incredible love between us came, obviously, from my parents, but also, you know, from my mom. You know, you know what? We were not allowed to argue with each other when we were growing up. We were not allowed, the siblings, my brother, my sister Tracy, we were not allowed to argue. My mom would say, you are not allowed to argue with your brother or sister. It's just not allowed. She would say, that's how wars get started. That's what she used to say. 100% oh, wow. right. So, so, you know, there was, I don't remember ever having an argument with my brother yes. or my sister. And I, I think it's a wonderful lesson for... Um, for siblings, it's just kindness. You just, just yeah, absolutely. Because we make life so complex and complicated, and and there, there are certain things there. Like you know, I'll go on the web and I'll see people writing uh, just the most most unkind uh, comments, and it's like there's a fundamental choice you make in your life. Like, are you going to be kind or are you going to be unkind? It's really sure. it's super simple. 
Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do now. We're going to hear from one of the siblings. And um, there, when, when, we, when Paul's finished, we're going to do a little bit on J-Bay, and then we're going to bring the legendary Spider Murphy in. Uh, I, I almost said Spider Merch. Do you remember him? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Paul Thompson. Paul. Paul, welcome to the show. You nice to be with you all. I love it. Love my South African connection. We're blessed. Yeah, very much. We're very blessed. Much. This is uh, Santa Barbara, which is north of Los Angeles. My folks were uh, vivacious, uh, beautiful, young beach people. My mom was absolutely gorgeous, stunning on the beach. My dad was really good looking, had a fast car, um, you know, <laughs> gold chains, um, uh, Mercedes Benz, Jaguar, Aston Martin. It was a natural progression that, uh, you know, Sean was athletic, I was athletic. Uh, and we, we really took a fancy to the ocean because of Ernie, my da our dad, who was yes, an avid, yes. uh, avid waterman. Uh, you know, Ernie was attacked by a shark in 48. Uh, went to came to America in 1949. Uh, went to that the winter of 49. Went to Hawaii. Uh, met the Duke of Hanamoko. So there was before we could really understand the depth of what we were getting into. There was already a rich history behind us sure. in terms of the ocean, and uh, we had already started to figure out currents, um, uh, figure out where the riptides were. Uh, we could figure out in the afternoon when the onshore wind blew onto the shore, it would blow the blue bottles and the, the Portuguese man sure. of war onto the beach. So all these yes. little intricacies and these fine details of, of the ocean were coming to us as young boys. Because of that Hawaiian history um, and because of the intenseness of, of my dad, we had that spirit, that spirit to to prove ourselves, to be strong, to have healthy competition. So we already had a lot of stuff besides the ocean. We had this physiological thing going on. And then we yes. sort of had the psychological thing going on that, you know, we had, we were safe in the water. We knew how big the swell was. We weren't going to be taking any serious risk because, man, I got some South African mentors and Sean has some South African mentors that were just so incredible to us. Um, you know, like like obscure, just obscure people uh, that were in the surfing community that really paid serious interest in us, like, uh, you know, yeah. Maxi Wetland, Mike Ginsberg, uh, John really Plater, well. Jeff Sanders, uh, Billy Sharp. You know, all of these, all of these things started to happen in like a cyclonic, and my yeah. dad was bringing all these people and, you know, I must say that as a as a young man, these these people, these peripheral people, were really a part of our competitive yeah. spirit. As a thirteen year old, I was trying to ch chase the sixteen year olds, so it worked cool. in a beautiful cycle. You know, you had yeah. the older guys, the nineteen twenty year olds that were dominating, yeah. and we were. Sean was behind the nineteen twenty year olds because he was sixteen. Yeah. I was thirteen, so I was behind Sean and his crew. So we would flow through the break and occasionally yeah. we'd have, as a 13 year old, I'd have to be raw hungry to catch, to be able yeah. to, f to feed into those guys, you know, to yeah. try and be competitive with those guys. Super healthy, super healthy sure. competitive spirit. But that's the nature of, of competitive, competitive yeah. anything. And that's the nature of surfing is to get, hey, I want to get the next wave. I want to get the next wave, but I don't want to burn anybody. So I have to, I have to understand the pecking order and I have to understand that these guys are better than me, but I'm coming up real close to, you might be the fastest gun today, but you're not going to be the yeah. fastest gun tomorrow. Sure. Sean was dialed into surfing. He, Sean want, yeah, Sean wanted to be, if there was the thought of a world champ uh, back in those days, Sean was thinking about being a world champ. I mean, at, at seven, eight, nine years old in Africa, in Durban, South Africa, we had posters of, of international surfers um, on our walls. And hey, bro, I got a story for you. So in, uh, 
69, 69, winter of 69. I'm walking to school. I'm going to Clifton. I've got my conservative school uniform on. I've got my yeah. satchel on. I don't know if you remember those <laughs> leather sandals that you used uh, to wear with yeah. socks. And I'm walking to school, you know, saying hi to all the dogs in the neighborhood. And the dogs in the neighborhood, sometimes they used to chase me. But I'm walking and I walk by the Natal Mercury, which was the local newspaper. Yes. And I took a double take and I go, hey, man, there's a surfer dude on the front page of the Natal Mercury in 1969. And I'm going, whoa, let me take a look at this. And I look again and it's freaking Sean Thompson, my brother on the cover of the Natal Mercury riding a 13, 14, 15 foot wave in Makaha, wow. Hawaii. And I go, and the headline was, South African boy con conquers Hawaiian waves. In yeah, the yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, so I see this stuff when I'm walking to school, and I'm just going, whoa, what the, what is really going on here? What is really yeah. happening? Yeah. And it had already... You know, Sean was winning every amateur contest, and we were for, we were yeah. sort of wanted to surf every contest that came up. However big the surf was, Sean Sean won every division for every yeah. year. Juniors, yeah. he won for six years in a row, South African champion, six years in a row, Gunston 500 winner six times in a row. I mean, if you yeah. just think about that, those simple things in his amateur Phenomenal. career, uh, just just incredible. So so yes. That cyclonic effect had already, all the people started to buzz around. There was a lot, a lot of young, fine young surfers, women and men yep. that were yep. involved in, in Sean's, uh, in, in the upcoming of us to where Sean yeah. had to go to Hawaii. He, he won everything in South Africa. Everything yep. was won by Sean. Now he had to go and prove himself in Hawaii and that in the big waters in the big waters and that was 69 his first his first year seven years later he would be world world yeah. champ surfer from this yeah. little dorpy called Durban South Africa Fantastic. Um, oh it's just it's just an incredible dream and it just warms my heart that as a youngster was Sean generally competitive by nature in surfing yes and generally competitive yes he wanted to be the man I never yeah. never never always with humbleness and dignity it's Absolutely. like he might not he might not say to you i'm gonna beat you in the next heat but i know in his spirit he was going you got no chance buddy i'm going yeah. after you hard um and sean has a gentle personality and a gentle character so uh <laughs> though there there were there were fist fights um it was always primarily with gentleness and kindness in his heart okay i'm gonna i'm gonna hand over to fires then to finish off here with, with of you course thank you know you. nice to meet Thanks you so thank you very much like but you see it was a constable it was in the sap for who is he my police but you could put police over yeah man for such like yeah i was eh? <laughs> i was <laughs> I was a constable in the South African police for two, Proper. 28 months, say. Proper, wow, yeah. Wow. Oh, right did when you do your, your national service? I did my national service ah. the year I was a copper, yeah. the year that Steve Biko died. Oh, my oh, word. Geez. Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't you. No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, bro. Bro, I was hanging out at the beach, bro. Gary Perkins and myself. <laughs> I swear, we'd check, out a, we'd check out a SAP bike. I'd be in my uniform. I'd sit on the back of the bike holding two boards because I started the South African Police Surf Club in, oh, no seven, in 77. So you could book off. Three members. Yeah. You could book <laughs> off and go surfing. And Gary, wow. per and Gary Perkis would pick me up. He'd be driving the SAP motorcycle. I'd hold the two boards. Gone to the beach, my bro, surfing. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, back with you, Sean. Yeah. Oh, so beautiful. My I know. So, you know, I've got two young sons, um, pretty much the same kind of age group as you, I mean, age difference as you two, and they both surf too. So, 
I love that advice your mother gave you saying that you must never argue because all I did was I make and you know, they used to fight, I used to put them in the bath and make them hold hands. So, <laughs> what a character then. Yeah. And so yeah, sure, that was really know, lovely. We know what you're really good at. What are you really bad at? <laughs> what, am I, what am I really bad at? Jeez, um, <laughs> Great question. I mean, it seems like there's a there's a lot of things that uh, that I can't. Uh, I'll, I'm gonna have to think. I'm gonna have to think about that one about what I'm really uh, really bad at. <clears throat> I was bad. Okay. I was very bad at cooking, but I'm, I must say I'm improving. I cooked dinner for my mother last night and the night before, and got the I've got my bra going here. I found a new type of bra. Oh yeah, no so I'm, I'm getting better. I'm getting better. Good. I love that answer. Okay. And then what still and will continue to fascinate you about life? <clears throat> you know, I love doing creative projects. <laughs> I love doing projects that I've never done before. I love having, you know, I love having a go. It's like, you know, every time you go surfing, um, you don't exactly know what you're going to get. There's going to be that, 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 that sort of next wave. So a few years back, you know, when I wrote Surface Code, I'd never written a book. Um, I'd never, uh, I'd never made a movie. I made, a, I made a super cool movie uh, called Busting Down the Door a few years ago. Oh, amazing, and the book, yeah. You know, you know when I started like in Instinct Sportswear, Instinct way back in the day, and we're going to be relaunching Instinct actually in, oh, really? in a oh, few really? months. So, so that was an amazing brand and was wonderful. To do that, and then and then my wife and I launched another. After I sold Instinct, we launched another brand here called Solitude, and I'm working on. Uh, you know, we're conceptualizing a new, perhaps a new documentary <coughs> that can really um, show people this code and, and 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 show people how important it is to to find purpose as a way just to being better and helping others be better. Um, Working on uh, working on a, on, a, on a couple of um, a couple of other projects, and then always pushing on on uh, you know my speaking my speaking work and my I, I like to think now that I like to say I'm a purpose activist. So I'm an activist of purpose. I help activate okay. purpose. So, so that's what uh, I was going to say to you. So your purpose is to get others to find theirs. Yeah, yeah. I activate, I activate. That's amazing. That's what I do. That's what I do. So, and and if you weren't a surfer, what would you have been? What would have well, been? Well, you know, you know, when I grew up, I was always going to be a professional person, but it was going to be like uh, when I was in varsity, I was studying accounting, and I was studying law. So those were the two paths. So I was going to be a professional. Professional surfer was not on the list. So so I went down a completely unexpected um, path and you know it's been wonderful to, to help build pro surfing and build the pro, build the surfing industry and um, and inspire and, and inspire young young mm. people so it's just been a um, it's been been an incredible run and it's been unexpected you know surfing's just taken me down such a different path. You know, I loved it from the first moment I stood up. And I'm always so appreciative and thankful that, you know, when I stood up on that first wave at the Bay of Plenty in 1965. No one ever forgets their first wave. Yeah, no one ever forgets it. But I was able to keep riding that wave in so many different ways, in so many different ways. And, and, and surfing gave it to me. So I'm always very, uh, very grateful to surfing. And yeah, having someone good. like Carla beside you, and Carla is just the most fantastic person in this world. Tell me about the um, secrets of a happy marriage, and and in that the mix of having that terrible loss. Yeah, so Carla's hot. She's a hot thing. Um, and I just saw her. You know, her mom and my mom were they were best friends before they both got married. Um, that's amazing. Kind of amazing, yeah. So they actually, she was born in SA, moved to London, then came back to South Africa, and her family came and stayed with us. Her mom and her sister and her dad, <laughs> when they were about 10 or 11 years old, came and stayed, stayed with us for a while while they 
came back to South Africa and got back on their uh, feet and found a new place. So you know, the family go, goes back a long way, but but we we didn't sort of stay connected when we were, when we were kids. And then I saw her in 1986. I just won a big surf contest in Cape Town, and I was out in South Africa, and I saw her across the room, and I went, "Wow, this—that's my girl. She's so hot." And I said to my brother, I went and, and chatted to her. I hadn't chatted to her for, I don't know, 20 years or something. I just chatted to her and I went back to my brother and said, I'm going to marry her. Wow. And I hadn't even gone on a date. I hadn't even kissed her. Um, and, uh, you know, then she made me like wait for a date. Good girl. I couldn't get a date. <laughs> and then I got a date and then it was on. <laughs> so give me the secrets of a good marriage. <laughs> well, it's not like with my brother and sister. There's no, there's not the situation where there's no rorting. There's still a bit of rorting, uh, but but we 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 very, I think we're very respectful of each other. Uh, she's still still red hot and beautiful, which is very she important. Is. She is. Um, she's also very creative, very talented, uh, a, a very organized. And I think we, um, you, you know, we don't stand on each other's toes. Um, and when, you know, when we had our, our terrible loss, so people, if you have a loss, people handle it differently. Even though you're married and you're close, a lot of marriages actually break up. Yeah. Lose, a, lose a kid. So we, but with us, it was like two trees falling over and we fell on each other. And, and I think we, we supported each other and, and, and we gave each other space and, and it wasn't like we had a timetable. Um, and I think both of us learned that, that you have to have, <coughs> you have to have, be completely forgiven of yourself oh, wow. and each other. So you have to have this, there's no blame. There cannot be any blame. And also there has to be an acceptance of the reality of, of the what is as opposed to the what if. Like, well, what if, well, what if I hadn't done this? Or, or what if I'd gone there? Or what if I, it, it's, so there's forgiveness, there's acceptance. And then also I think uh, you need to get involved with, with when I say you need to, I'm, I'm, this is just my, my experience. Uh, my perspective. Uh, there's no. I don't give prescriptions. I just give a perspective. I think um, it's important to get involved with creative and inspirational projects that are good for you, but also good for others. Like after I lost um, Matthew, I released my book and I started speaking in front of large crowds. And I started. I did busting down the door. I did a lot of creative projects that, that did two things. I think they both inspired me, they inspired others, but also they, they kept the memory of my beautiful yeah. boy alive. It was like they were dedicated to um, to Matthew. And then I think it's so important from, from my perspective is to get back to your faith, whatever that might be. I'm Jewish, but you can be Christian, Muslim, Baha'i, or Hindu, whatever, whatever your faith is, reconnect with your faith, uh, reconnect with your, your, your family and friends. And if they want to help you, you must let them, you must let them help you. Yes, I should give um, my wife your telephone number. Yeah, and then, and then <laughs> surfing, yeah, surfing. <laughs> surfing was so... You know, like I like to think that I've been stoked all my life until then. My, my, you know, stoked, it's like a fire, man. It's like a fire inside you. And my fire had, had gone out. And then I had a mate in Durban, this guy Graham Taylor. We sat right next door, right, I guess we're right next door to each other. You know, we were best of friends. We'd surf together and listen to all the music together. We we're just really good mates. And he kept phoning me, hey, Sean, let's go surfing, let's go surfing, let's go surfing. And, and uh, eventually I went, okay. So he took me surfing. Um, 
to this place up by Belicho Bay. I've never surfed it before. So we walk down to the beach and, and it's the surf is perfection. It's about four feet, uh, like autumn in Durban, offshore wind, and the Indian Ocean, the sun is just boiling up through the ocean, you know, because we're on the east coast and it just it's like it's exploding out of the sea. It's like a Gunston ad. We used to have those Gunston ads where the sun would come up. And um, we walked down these steps and I, and I jumped in the wood and I paddled out and I, and I was crying. I was very, very upset. But it was like the, the salt water, the waves were washing my tears away. It was just an amazing sensation. Fantastic. And I paddled out and I got a wave. And I could feel, you know, Matthew was with me and I got another wave and I got another wave. And then uh, just me and, me and uh, Graham. And then I paddled up to Graham. I said, hey, gee, what's the name of this wave? And, you know, surfers have great names for the waves they ride. And he said, he said it's called Sunrise sunrise and, and and i think that that represented a new sunrise for me that day and i got stoked again and surfing became super oh, popular. Yeah. yeah so surfing is surfing or whatever sport or passion that you have whether it's just walking on the beach or climbing a mountain or, or, or you know coaching kids for cricket or rugby or whatever it, it's you know that connectivity to sport and passion it's just so um uplifting and 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 your life might be off balance and it can just help get you back to your equilibrium fantastic thank you for sharing that sean can you go back to surfing i'm a little bit concerned about spider i'm sure he could have shaped about three surfboards in this time yeah oh, please but... spider, the legend <laughs> god of <laughs> shape yeah, absolutely. But if you don't mind, can you maybe just share a little bit of your first trip to J-Bay with us? I think it was in 68, was it not? Yeah, 68, my dad got a Jeep Wagoneer. You know, you know my dad used to love cars. Paul, Paul said they're like Aston Martin's Jags. You know, he was always <laughs> loved his fast cars. But he got this Jeep Wagoneer. Uh, I think it was the only one in Durban. This big Jeep, and uh, we had put roof racks on top, we put our boards on top, and then in the back was squeezed uh, my brother, uh, Jeremy Yates, this red hot surfer from, from Bay of Plenty in Durban, and then my cousin. We were all facing each other, and, and we drove off, and we were on the way to Cape Town for the South African Surfing Championships, and we stopped off at J Day. So we stopped off, and uh, we stayed in the, it was called the Beach Hotel. And uh, where's the point? You know, we found out where the point was. And that morning we drove down to the point in our Jeep wagon here and we jumped out and they were the most perfect, best waves we'd ever seen in our lives. It was like every surfer's dream to go on a surfing safari. And then when you get there and the surf is perfect and there's no one out, it's just us, the three, the, 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 the four of us. And, 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 we walk across these like sharp rocks because in Durban there's no rocks. You know what I mean? We couldn't believe the rocks. We tiptoe across the rock. We've got our little, little wetsuits on, our little five foot six V bottoms, and we, and we paddle out into this perfect perfection waves. And, and, and that for me, it's like the first time I stood up on a board at Bay of Plenty. The first time I paddled out at Jeffrey's Bay was perfect. So those memories, you know, it's like they sear into your into your consciousness and your subconscious. It's like, it's just like part of me, that amazing experience. And, and was it from that first trip that, f from that moment on, you developed this, uh, what would it be, 50, 50 odd year um, relationship or, or love for super tubes? Loved it. And you know, in those days, we didn't serve super tubes because the way was too fast. We used to serve the ask you. Ride down at the point, and then over the years, we moved up. To, to tubes and then we moved up to super tubes because back then there was no leashes and, and yes. it just looked like super tube broke too close to the rocks and it was too too fast to to ride <clears throat> but i just developed this um love and we used to go down there nearly every school holidays we'd go down there in july and we'd go down there in december and with my dad and <clears throat> my brother and sister <clears throat> michael thompson and, and my cousin well, and, and jeremy and, and our friends and it was just uh, it, it just reminds me of, um, you know, that pure spirit of, of, of youth and that, and that 
amazing stone. Yeah. We're going to play a little clip of you at J-Bay, especially for those, for, for those viewers who haven't seen you in action at J-Bay. So you've got a... a in this period, the Thompson began an intimate relationship with Jay Bay, a spot many feel he rode better than anyone before or since. It was here that he adopted his low, sprawling stance, constantly rocking his board from rail to rail, eyes focused well down the line. It's also where he tuned what became one of the cleanest roundhouse cutbacks in the game. The varied sections and complexity of Jeffries taught Sean pacing, and the benefits of long, fluid turns. It marked his style indelibly. Oh, Jamie, I love it. Yes, you're on top of your game there. Yeah. Hey, Sean. <laughs> that, um, that first clip of you as a youngster, would that have been that 68 trip? No, that would have been... Um, that, you know, I've got to, say, I've got to tell you this, because... There are, there are going to be a couple of guys that have got absolutely eagle eyes. That's actually not even J Bay, that very first trip. That is St. Michael. <laughs> that's, that is, that's St. Michael's on sea. And that oh, is really. taken in 1970. So, oh, yeah, really. isn't that a classic that they made a mistake in the movie? And normally, it, you know, looks, it certainly looks like J Bay. Looks like J Bay. Yeah. Like, yeah, very much so. And of all the, the sessions you've had at J Bay, any one particular session stick out in your mind? Or are they all the same? No, 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 I've had some great sessions there. You know, I had this uh, this one session I had in the, uh, would it have been maybe 79 or 80. And this was before people had built their lives around surfing. You know, so during the week, it was absolutely uncrowded. Sometimes there'd be no one out. And, and on yeah. this one day, I was the first guy out. <laughs> big, like, when I say big, so JB doesn't really get that big, but it's strong. You know, it was like an eight to 10 feet, eight to 10 foot dead, strong. And I'm, I'm the only guy out in the lineup, and I'm sitting there waiting for a wave, and a set comes, and this whole school of dolphins, I don't know, it looked like about hundreds of them just came towards me. And it's amazing, JB, you have this massive school of dolphins, and they're coming towards me, and I swing around, and I paddle into this wave, and I take off, and I'm riding. This wave with the dolphins, as I cut back, they cut back. They're just everywhere under me uh, in the wave. There. It was just amazing. And then Fantastic. they all disappear as I get down into the inside section called Impossibles, where the wave gets like really, really hollow. And the sun's coming up over the, uh, over the, 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 you know, just off the water towards the mountains there. And I'm inside Maybe the tube, slipper. way, way back, and it's dark in there. And as I start coming up, Two dolphins must have been riding the wave with me. They jump. They jump through the tube right in front of me. I actually, I think I'm going to actually bash into the dolphins. They're right there. And I, I ride through this spray and I kick out. It was like insane. That was like, it was the greatest wave I ever had. And the only person on earth who saw it was me. And the only person oh, on earth who experienced that was me. So it was very, uh, it was a beautiful moment. My best moment at j -Bet. Okay, we're going to play a little clip, and then if you don't mind, we're going to go into your Hawaiian experiences and involve Spider. Probably wouldn't be uh, complete without another Jeffrey's Bay legend, Bruce Gold. <laughs> Bruce, uh, Bruce, how are you, my man? Fine with a positive. Have a seat, Bruce. Yes, Bruce, you've obviously got a lot of memories um, of Sean Thompson and the Thompson family. Sure, sure. Only with a cigarette holder on the beach and his little beach buggy, sure. Always very polite to me, I must admit that. Eh? And, and Sean surfing, you obviously um, admired him for many years. Oh, yeah, yeah. He likes to wind up on the bigger waves, wind up for his bottom turn. <laughs> Always look good. He the does. weaving, does, the yeah. weaving. Looks good always. Yeah, and Bristol, do you recall when you first saw Sean Thompson in the water? Oh, man, that's Bay of Plenty days. You know, it, was, it was after longboards because but it was a police month at the yard. So it was, it was Paul Thompson. Long time. Paul he was a, a, yeah. a policeman as well, a gunstool. Yeah, it was short board time. But 
He used to surf with my young brother. He always used to ask after Ritz, yeah. Because okay. they surfed on belly boards. They all had Max Westland belly boards. What sort of years were you talking about? What sort of era? In the middle, mid 60s. Okay. Because after the 60s, yeah. Uh, mid, mid 50s. 58, I came back to Durban. Do you have any particular or indelible memory in your mind of Sean at, say, Big Super? And now the last time I saw Sean, hey, but I don't know what I was doing out there, it was large. I had paddled out from Checkers Beach Break on my nine foot Malibu, but it's a sleek one, it's a very curved Malibu. Three stringers, a special model. <laughs> Too good to surf almost. Yeah. And I paddled way with boneyards and hey, yeah, this thing closed out on me. If there was another wave coming, I would have washed in, but I managed to get out again and I sat right outside Super and, and Tubes. And was in the water as well. I sat right outside Super Tubes, having a gathering my wits, hoping not to get your wave. And someone paddled out from the pack. I was 50 meters further out and came, shook my hand and said, hey, I'm glad not to be the oldest bunny in the water. <laughs> and it was Sean. I'm still <laughs> ripping. I mean, how many years ago did this be? No, this was recent. Oh, really? Yeah, just before COVID. Okay. He hadn't been back to Jeffrey's Bay for 14 years. Yeah. And then he came back. Yes. And then while we were up there, this big set came. And Sean had already edged. No, he had edged onto my inside. And he, <laughs> he would have gone right or wrong, Sean. He would have gone if he could have caught it. But my mind picture was just correct for that one. <laughs> he couldn't get in there. But. Anyway, yeah. you, you got a message for the Thompsons there, Brewster? Peace, love, God. Journey's over. Some grow younger. <laughs> Some grow younger. May the, may the wings, may the wings of your surfing never lose a feather, to quote our Oliver Wendell Holmes. That's the South <laughs> African one, not the American one. <laughs> Brewster, thank you very much. It's great to see you. Classic. Love this change there, Sean. Yeah. Sean, how are you doing? You don't need a break at all? No, I'm good, I'm good. Okay, Spider, you're up, Don, then? Yeah, let's bring him in. Sean, we're going to, um, if you don't mind, we're going to move to your trips to Hawaii, which is obviously where your career really took off, I would imagine. And we've read, and it's so well documented, the role Spider played in your successes in Hawaii. So welcome, Spider Murphy. Thank you. Great to How be here. How are you doing, Spider? Can you hear us? Yeah, You're awake. Thank I'm you sorry. very much for your patience. Sure. Spider, just a little bit of background uh, to yourself and your um, surfboard building career. Yes. So I started off uh, a, a company called War Surfboards with a friend of mine, and it was named after Eric Byrne and the group War. And uh, so we did it for like about three years. And Espacito was my team rider and Willie Sills. And then, um, and eventually, my friend, uh, my partner, he lost interest. And he said, "Hey, listen, I'm, I'm over this." So then, Graham Hines heard that I was sort of available, and he invited me to join Safari. So, um, so we started with with, uh, with Graham, and uh, I still got the very first board I shaped for him, um, and I, I kept that. I was so lucky to find it, and um, yeah. So we Graham was a great guy to work with, and. Um, and I actually changed his business. I came and I worked hard because I, I liked working, shaping and that. And we did glassing, did all the, all the work that I could actually make the whole circle by myself, even blowing blanks yes. as well. And then, um, and then uh, Graham told me that, uh, hey, look, uh, the, the Thompsons have just won the, the Mattel Champs, I think it was. And the prizes were Eka had, had sponsored these boards, one for Michael and one for Sean. <clears throat> oh, here we go. So. Anyway, I did my best, I shaped up, you know, Sean gave me all the info that he, what he wanted, and they liked them. And from there, it, it, it took off, and we slowly, gradually... That, that got relationship there. began. Yes, yeah. And it's then... Of, it's, I beg your pardon, carry on. And then... No, no, carry um, on, carry on. And then, the, you know, the, the shapes started changing, they started getting, you know, we started getting those sort of gunny boards and that, and then Sean... Uh, was, was uh, I actually saw tube riding actually start properly, and it was Michael and Sean, and it was in the tail champs we had, and it was the bay was like six to eight feet, these perfect big peak barrels, and I saw Michael take off on one, and he, he went in the barrel, came out, and he was so surprised he actually fell off. Sean saw that and said, <laughs> "Hey, I'm going to be better than this," 
and Sean paddled on the inside. They swung around, and that's where barrel riding started. And Sean pulled into the barrel, came out the other side, and then they were dead. They couldn't stop. They were just doing it all day long. And um, yeah, on, so, on those boards that you had made for them. Yes, and so that that put pressure on us to start fine tuning the, the you know the the, the designs and that. And uh, you know, Sean was pushing you know the, the designs. You know, he, he had like seven sixes, and he told me that one day that he was driving them so hard to get through the barrels that he needed every single inch on the on the board. And so we were just fine tuning the rails, and I'd have pictures on the wall of Sean surfing, and I'd look at the rail, you know, the water coming over, and that's that's what I sort of was my sort. The, the curve and the and the and the flow of the board so um and then i even started do, drawing foils and that's that's been my lifetime thing is foiling boards the whole time and 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 the curves the curves are so beautiful and uh, so that's that's how we, we started off and then one day sean came in i think he was 16 17 and he was stoked he just came out the water and he just looked at the boards and he says hey i like this board I like that board i want this board <laughs> So I said, well, those are just stock boards, you know, and you could see, you're still wet from surfing. And, and here's a, a good example that, that the world needs to know about. Is from that day, I, I, there was a surfer who was stoked. He was so stoked. And you know what? The corporate world don't understand what that is. Being so stoked is like the world is open to him. And you know that he's, he's going to be a world champion or whatever it is. And you get him this hard thing that, that you feel so great. I had a surf at New Pier the other day. The water was blue, there were dolphins swimming past, and these waves were just going from end to end. The equipment was great. And we were flying down the line and bashing the waves, and it was just amazing. And you come out the water, and I walked into my factory, and I was actually, I felt like I was on a cloud. You know, you got this feeling that you don't get from anything else but surfing. And, sure. um, and, and this is, this is it's, it's, you know, you get payment for what you do. You, know, you, 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 you pay for a service that you do. And, um, that is part of the payment, you know. You just, yes. you know, that's, that does it such good, and it just brings you away from the stressful world onto this cloud of, of just amazing, amazing things. And if I can think of anything, it's it's a thrill of surfing. It's uh, it's the excitement. It's nothing nothing touches it. And Thor knows that I had a tube once at bay there, and it and this thing just threw over me and it shut off. And I thought, okay, I'm standing in the blue silver barrel. And so it opened out and it blew out. I came out the side of oh, wow, that's something of a lifetime. Could never ever forget that ever ever. Still, I still see it in my mind. So yeah, I, so I, I heard you talking to um, Sandy earlier yes. about um, how you find relaxation and so on yes. when we yeah. were sitting up. Yes. So so this this is what I learned from form, being stoked. And I think any surfer that wants to go on the world tour and he's not doing well, just go back into the mountains and think about it. Think about it. And get find that stoke that that keep motivated. And equipment makes a big difference. So if you're on a yes. board that goes goes amazing, it's it's going to help you get that stoke. So thanks, Sean. That's been a lifetime thing for me. You know, it, was, it was amazing. <laughs> so and, and Spider, just off the top of your head, it, it might not yeah. be of any great relevance, but how many boards do you think you've shaped in your in your career? I've lost count. I've lost count. Yeah, every day I'm pumping them out, and um, I, I enjoy it so much. And yes. um, so, so what I've done is um, I started off when basically when you know, Sean started off and we went through, I went through the whole business thing. I was in partnerships with the Graham Hines and Lorraine Hines. So eventually they left and I got in another uh, partnership. And um, and then that's, uh, and I've, I've been sort of fighting this thing the whole way and also stressful too because, you know, you have um, financial situations and that. And then, um, so some of my partners left and I was in, I ended up with one partner and eventually we sort of got him out. And, uh, and then I was in the, then the waves were pumping at North Beach every day from November right through to March. Every day was just firing and I was there every morning. I got flu, I surfed through the flu and then, and then I started getting out of breath and I couldn't work out what's going on. You know? I thought, oh, that's strange. Because I used to run from then in the bay would go and I'd run down to the bay, no problem, and run back, no problem. And then I get halfway and I'm out of breath. So, and then the one day I paddled out and I thought, "Whoa, something's wrong." So I, I, uh, I just didn't paddle. I just, saw, I just drifted in my board, got into the sand, walked up the beach, went to my cardiologist. He gave me angiogram. He said, "You've got two blocked vessels." I said, "What?" Oh, I couldn't believe it. So I said, "And so, so he said, you're going to have to have a double bypass." I said, "Okay." So I went through all that, and then I went back to square one, 
you know, you know, I had to learn to walk and you know, getting back on the board again and, and learn to light up and stand up and, and the confidence thing. And, um, and then I slowly sort of learning a lot of things. And what I did learn about was the conscious mind, the subconscious mind. Yes. And, uh, and right now, uh, it's, a, it's like a Bible to me. Yeah, it all comes from the Bible. You know, yeah, all the business work to that. It's an incredible, incredible thing. So if there's anything you want, you just say, I want this. I got it. And that's it. And it happens. And yes. so what does well, through my stress, you know, through my stressful times, you know, in, in business and that is I have a problem, I just stay on that track. That's a positive, positive. It's incredible. It's helping my surfing. So now when I paddle out, I'm not negative, I'm positive. And I know I just I just say you know, you know it's like Sean in your in your um, in your surfing career, you know, you look at look at the ocean, you're going out in the heat and you you, you visualize yourself surfing waves, surfing waves. And then it all happens for you, just paddle out and it happens. And if you don't do that, then there's an incredible, incredible um, journey I've been through, and it's just getting better. And so my job now is to teach people to work and give them opportunities. And also the design is coming out amazing. I'm just Fantastic. Now that's just coming together. And so it's so exciting. And I just, uh, my bad habits are getting up early in the morning, three o'clock, two o'clock, sometimes yeah. one o'clock. And I, and I just study the YouTube thing. And yes. it's really what I've learned, yeah. And it's just, uh, I'm getting fitter. Getting, I hope to get to I was going well. to ask you if you're feeling fit. Yes, uh, so my diet is super healthy. You know, I have, uh, you know, my, my, my diet is normally as many vegetables as possible. And um, and I have all the superfoods and my smoothies and that in the mornings. Drink coffee, <coughs> but uh, a little bit of wine here and there. But other than that, yeah. um, I think I'm Fantastic, pretty healthy. Fantastic, well done. Yeah, and, so, and the, the resin fumes and so on and the... The dust from the sandy and so on. Not well, I was actually you, worried, I was So I was actually really worried about that because when I went in, uh, uh, the surgeon Dr. Klein look, he, he said to me, "Listen, so you the spider?" I said, "Yes." He says, "Don't worry, I'll look after you." <laughs> <laughs> so he, so when I came out, he said, oh, "I did a short little cut there for you. Don't worry." And he said, "I saw your lungs; they're beautiful." He said, "They're beautiful." And think, oh, thank goodness, because <laughs> you know, I worried, about, yeah. I worried about the fumes and all the bad dust and things yes, like that. I'm so, sure. Yeah. And Spider, now to, to get onto this, um, am I right in saying that board that you and Sean designed or you designed for Sean, did that come about by accident? Well, you know, it's funny that I speak about the stoke and, and working with Sean, uh, Sean is so professional. I mean, he, at a young age, he would he said, listen, what time do you want to come in? And it's three o'clock, he'd walk in exactly at three o'clock, not, not a minute past or before, just at three o'clock. I don't know how he did it, but he always came on time. And he was always professional. And once he wrote his board, he either phoned me or dropped by the shop and let me know how, how the board goes, which is so important to shape it because, you know, you need that direction. Are you on the yes. right track? So Sean was very, very professional. And I just wish so many more South African surfers would listen to or listen to the way he did you know, his professional career. And it's definitely the, you know, it's definitely the, the, the right way to do it. And um, I just see it, you know, I, I coach a lot of surfers. And they, they seem to miss that mm. of that professionalism. It's so, so important. Mm. And he's the best at it. Nobody has better than him. Yeah, and, and that, that pink banana now. Yes. Why don't you just give us a little bit of background to the board and to the actual so, making of the board? Yeah, so um, Sean came to me and said to me, uh, you know, you wanted, you wanted this board for uh, Sunset Away. And I didn't know what Sunset Away was like. So I said, what is it like? He said, just take cave rock, 15 feet. Said, okay. So I had my mind <laughs> the solid way. Meanwhile, it was in the, you know, when, when, it, when it gets 15 feet, it breaks out in the ocean. So I had yeah. that in my mind, the hollow, you know, the hollow, you know, the, the board shaped uh, to put the hollow away. And um, the way it worked out, it worked at that pipeline, not sunset. So, well, we, we still, <laughs> it still worked, thank and, goodness. And if, if I may ask from a, a layman's point of view, yes. was the rocker, Designed in such a way to fit in with that with a drop yeah. at pipeline. Yes, yeah, that was. I took that board and I measured the center, then I measured out six foot, and it was exactly the same curve as the boards of today. How was that? I didn't. Uh, I never. I looked at it and I thought, hey, there's something in this board. What is it? And there it was. So there was, that was part of it. it was quite amazing. Mm. And and Sean, the first time you wrote the board. Yeah, you know that board was. Um... It was such a fluke because it was so it was so different. It had way more curve than any board that I think that had ever been written before. I think principally because 
Spider wanted to get some some more curve in it and put some bricks on it, as you tell me, Spider, and it, it, it sort of bent it more, even more. You know, it's, that's like South African, the South African way, bull like a plan. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, <laughs> South Africa just they, they just do their own thing, you know, in order to like get to the objective. So. Mm -hmm. It was made for sunset, but I remember I took it out at sunset and the board had so much curve in it. And my first wave, I, as I stood up, I did a bottom turn, I spun out because the board had so much curve. It, it just, and as I spun out, a guy ran me over and, and then I lost the board and paddled in there to go to the hospital. And then, uh, and then the pipeline came up and, and I took it out at the pipeline and I only had the one board with me that was long enough to ride really big pipeline. And I remember paddling up with it. And of course, the guys were giving me a hard time. You know, where are you going with that pink banana? What are you going to do out there with it? <laughs> well, it was pink. It was supposed to be yeah. pink. But it's uh, hard left the Or Graham Hines had left a bit of white pigment in the red when he did the mix. So it came out. Uh, what can you do? You can see the top was red, but it came out pink on the bottom. So the guys were giving me a bit of a hard time. And I remember paddling out there. And, you know, I was very really nervous, took me a while to get away. But once I, I got that first wave, because it had so much curve, it fitted in perfectly into the very hollow wave of the pipeline. Yes. And it also enabled me to, to take the drop later than guys had taken the drop before. They call it a riding backhand or riding backside with your back to the wave. And it also enabled me to, to do radical bottom turns and go straight up and, and, and do big carves off the top, which had never been done there before before so I, it was like i had this not just a technological edge but also had a confidence edge yes so you know just suit my it suited my type of surfing but you know that board was was revolutionary but i think the <clears throat> the other boards that spider made me so that board was a 710 for big surf so the, the boards that spider made me were surf between six and ten feet the boards that were really the tube riding boards, these blue boards that he made me. Now those boards were the first boards that they call it today a single to a double concave. So it had a, yes. a concave under my front foot for speed when I was inside the tube and it had these two concaves going out uh, on, on, on the tail of the board on the V, which enabled the board to, to really accelerate. And I could ride deeper than anyone had ever ridden the tube before. I could actually ride, they called it riding on the foam ball, which is, yeah. which is only something that's really been developed relatively recently. So, so that type of board enabled me to do, I think, really futuristic surfing. And that board, blue boards that Spider made me, design, I think were the forerunner of the modern curves. Yes. And, uh, and then they were so advanced, I think, for the time, Spider. And even, you know, you told me a few years ago, you took the curve of a modern board and put it on that old seven-footer. And it yeah. perfectly. So, so you must remember, boards in those days were hand-shaped. So Spider yeah. had to come up with this. This is a, it was a creative process. It wasn't like, just put it in the shaping machine and it's going to spit out a perfect curve. Yes. You know, he had to create that curve, which is, it's incredibly difficult. It's, it's, it's like a sculpture. Yeah. Um, and those boards, they were amazing. And, and I mean, they, Did, they, they, they helped me. I won the world title on Spiders boards. I won the sure. Masters on Spiders boards. I won so many events. And then from there, there was a progression to twin fins. And there were just so many amazing boards spinning that you showed me. And, and mm. all from those first curves. So Spiders showed me my first board in 1972. With a big Akai on it, maybe had a yeah, yeah. tape recorder on it. Um, <laughs> from then on, it was just a you know, just a, we had a wonderful relationship, and you know, I just want to thank you for all those. Yeah, some yeah. of the best moments of my life are when you have you on your boards. Magnificent, and, and, and tell me, Sean, the rest of the pack did they then try and follow suit or emulate um, that particular board that Spider had shaped you? You know, that board was so radical that it. it that I think people started to follow it in terms of um, uh, almost like a beacon, but never exactly. In fact, a couple of years ago, I was at a big event here in, in California, and they were honoring 
Lifetime Achievement Award, Simon Anderson, who developed the thruster. Legendary, one of the greatest, Max Spider, one of the greatest shapers and designers of all time. So Spider came up to me and, and he said, Sean, you know, there's only been one other board made by another shaper that I've ever wanted as my own. And that's that pink banana that Spider shaped for you. So, <laughs> so that was a wonderful thing to hear. And, and, and you know, Spider's had this fundamental uh, influence on, um, on many shapers and many surfers around the world. I mean, he shaped boards for lots of incredible surfers, Martin Potter, and Shane Haran, and you know, all yes. sorts of amazing, Mark Thompson, all sorts of amazing guys who've gone on to to, to great success. But um, but I really, you know, thank you for what, the, the amazing boards you've done for me, Spider. They've really, they've been amazing. And Sean, just before we bring Sandy back in yet, those boards that you wrote in the 70s, have you kept them or did you get rid of them? Yeah, you know, most days you were just, you know, you had few boards. You didn't have many boards. You just ride them and ride them until they broke, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, I broke most of the great, great ones. I've actually still got, got the first twin fin that Spider made me, which I think is one of the greatest twin fins I've ever made. And I won so many contests on, 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 on this twin fin that, that he made me in, uh, in 1982. I uh, still got that board. Um, yeah. But uh, no, Spider's got a couple there, I think. <laughs> well, just um, we're going to go and have a look at some of the comments here because Spider's very kindly allowed us to try and auction off a pink banana replica. Wow. Amazing. So we're going to do it at the end, but I'm just going to disappear to go and look at. I'm going to find some heavy hitters in the comments section. Um, we've got a reserve on it of 10,000, but we'll come back to it. Uh, that's ZAR, and um, yeah, hopefully we can make some money and then donate the money to you and you can give it to a charity of your choice. So we're going to try, I'm going to go and look at um, some of the, the messages and find out if there are any heavy hitters there. So if you don't mind, Sandy, you take over for a while. Then we come back and we're going to do the dangers of pipeline, Sean. <laughs> okay, Spada? Sean, I've got a few, a few more questions for you. Yes. I sorry, Sandy. Spada, you're Hi, welcome yeah. to sit in the um, backstage there. Yeah. I'm okay. going to come back to you unless okay. you have to go somewhere. No, it's fine. 100%. Thank great. you, Spider. Okay, I'm heading over to you, Sandy. And Thank you. Um, Sean, what does it take to become a world champ? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that, that's, a, um, uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big question. But I, I, think, I think, firstly, it takes the stoke. Uh, you know, Spider, Spider spoke about how... He always thought like I was one of the most stoked people he ever met. Yeah. Um, I have a friend who's one of the most um, eminent lawyers here on the West Coast. He does huge cases and he lectures up at Stanford. And uh, he told me, Sean, you know, uh, I asked you a question once about what it takes to become a world champion and, and, and how did you do it? And I said, I said, well, number one, I was just more stoked than anyone else. Um, and he, he told me that he lectured on this. You know, I spoke to this guy who was a world champion. Asked, and uh, so so that's essential because you know with that passion and and with that purpose, uh, there's no such thing as practice ever. I never ever thought of a surf session in my entire life as practice. Never. Ever, ever, ever did I think of going surfing as being practical. I just loved it. It's a uh, and I just think I loved it during my 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 time on tour. I competed my first pro contest in 1969. I competed my last pro contest when I retired in 1989. It was 20 years. I surfed more than anyone else on the planet. Wow. I put more time in the water. And not because I wanted to be the best, but because I loved it. And I think with that love, um, and obviously I had, I had talent and I had commitment. I had discipline. I was a lifelong learner. Uh, to be a learner, you've got to be humble. Um, yeah. So I, I was a lifelong learner. I would read everything that had ever been written uh, about surfing. I'd read every single book ever written on surfing. I'd, uh, and I used to love to read sports biographies and autobiographies about, you know, how sportsmen got the edge, you know, what they do. So I was always very fascinated um, 
by not just the mechanics, but but the philosophy and the psychology of uh, of sport. But it all came from the stoke, you know. I was super stoked, um, and then from a, from a young age, I, I also um, I stayed away from drugs, completely stayed away from drugs. And and in that period of surfing, there's a lot of dope, yeah, um, all sorts of dope. But I, st- I just made a commitment. I would stay away from from drugs. And uh, I remember in, uh, the, the first year I took the pink banana to Hawaii, I, I was doing my first year at university. So I was like 19 years old. Um, and I, you know, I was offered a guy actually I, that I was staying with um, while I was staying in a room that I was renting from his family. And he lived up. So, you know, he offered me he said, hey, Sean, you've got to try this. Uh, he was, had some aluminium foil and was smoking this white powder, burning it underneath with a burner and smoking. Hey, Sean, you've got to try it. You've got to try it, man. All the guys at Pipeline are doing it. And I'm going, nah, what is it? He said, no, you've got to try it. It's called China White. And I'm going, China White? What's China White? He said, man, come on, you've got to try it. And, and the process, they call it chasing the dragon. I said, no, well, what is it? He said, it's heroin. So I just went, there's no way. And I'm out of there. And I, you know, I went, I left and I moved out and moved to another place. And, you know, the guy overdosed, died a few months you look later. look at the lines, you know. Yeah, so it was really, uh, you know, we all come to those crossroads when we're young. I, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to um, make a bad choice or not? And, um, you know, I was lucky. I made, I made, I made a lot of good good choice and, and for me you know what shattered me was was here's my beautiful son Matthew and he made that one one bad choice so you know that's that's one of the things that, that kind of motivates me now to speak to schools universities and 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 people generally large corporations or groups uh, you, you know you've got to think about that you have to think about that when you, when you're talking to big big groups or even small groups do you see when people get it? Do you see their light comes on when you're talking to them? Do you have that sort of perception I around your audience? To, for, for some people in the audience, um, you, you know, some people have are cynical. But that's why my process, it's a perspective. It's not a prescription. I'm yeah. not up there telling you, in, in anyone which path to travel on because – we make the choice and we make we make the decision. But but I, I tell people and young people especially, you know, that decision is going to come your way, and it's going to be a life and death decision. And like, what can I do? How can I help you? Yeah. Well, perhaps you could write your code. Twelve lines. Every line begins with "I will" as a way to have this sense of personal power. Um, but I also say, just think twice. Yeah. Just wonderful. Think twice, and, and, and I do these events with thousands of students at big universities. It's great, and I go, the decision's going to come your way. So what are you going to do? And I go, I can't hear you. What are you <laughs> going to do? And then and then I get think twice, and then I go, what are you going to do? And then I get them to shout it louder, and then I get them to shout it louder, and then I get them to shout it louder. So I, I hope that. Um, with this process, uh, that there's going to be one kid out there that's going to Absolutely. come to the crossroads and is going to going to think t- twice. I mean, my work is my work. You're doing that. Work is worthwhile. Yeah. Because I, I think that, and I, and I get I get back so many beautiful letters from oh wow from young people, and, and not just from young people, from other people. I lost fifty pounds uh, as a result of the code. 50 pounds, how about that? My relationship with my child is better. Uh, uh, I will live another day. Uh, thank you for the hope you've shared with me. And these are, are statements that... Okay, we've got Sean. No, Sean's back. Sean's back, eh? Okay. Yes. Sean, you back there? Yep. No, no. no not back. Check amongst you guys. Okay. Mike, do you surf? I used to, Sandy, when I was very young. Um, and, but I've got an incredible love for the sport. Um, 
I surfed until um, I got to a certain age where cricket sort of took over. Uh, cricket was my first passion. Um, Spider's still in backstage here. Let's bring Spider on. Yeah, bro, Spider, yeah. come back on. Hello, Spider, we've lost Sean. Are you linking up with Sean there again, Gary? Uh, he'll come back on. Spider, how are you doing? Are you all right? Really you don't need to go and have a leak. You've been sitting there since 4.30. No, I sneak out every now and again. <laughs> okay. Did you get your glass of wine? <laughs> yeah. I'm, um, not really. I'm just drinking tea, thank you. I'm going to drive I, I must tell you, um, PT, PT has unfortunately bailed. He says he uh, can't get the signal right. Um, uh, so unfortunately, we've we've lost Peter Townend. But um, what we're going to do when Sean comes back, we're going to go into um, maybe the dangers of Pipeline and some of his challenges on um, mm. uh, at Pipeline and on the North Shore, and then a little bit about busting down the door. Yeah. And um, yeah, and then Sandy, maybe just yeah. for for the viewers. Your association with surfing? Oh, um, and my younger brother, Anthony, you met him. Yeah. Um, and I also wondered why I was very sporty and I wondered why I didn't surf and I'm 61. And I remember yeah. very clearly what Sean said, my father said to me, you get on that beach, they're drugs and they're bad people. And, oh, really? <laughs> um, and so it had a bad rap. So that's why I didn't start surfing in the 70s. I should have. Because mm. I eventually mm. started six years ago, and so that was when I was 56. Yeah, 55. okay. Yeah. I started surfing because both my boys, my younger boys are now 25 and 24, are big surfers. And um, yeah, so I I got onto a longboard uh, with my brother, Anthony, and he put, put me pushed me onto a wave at Hewlett's, and I caught my first wave when I was 55. Well, it's, it's another thing that amazes me about Sean. I mean, his resistance to temptation. Yeah. Must have been incredible. Yeah, I mean, Spider, yeah, you'd know a lot more about that. But I mean, he he literally had the world at his feet. Yes. And understood. yeah, and and you know, I was going to say earlier, and I, I I was reluctant to say it earlier, when you were talking about Sean's professionalism. Yes. Maybe that's why he's the only South African world or South African ever to become world champion. Yeah. And I, I, with respect so to Jordy have... Smith, as much as I'd love to, sorry. Jordy's become sorry, world so, champ. Who was that? Jordy was world uh, champ. Was he world champ? Yeah. I think he's a junior, junior champ, eh? Yeah. I don't think he's won on the, the senior circuit as yeah, much as I'd love to see him win on the senior circuit. Yeah. But he was a world junior champ. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But okay. All right. What we're going to do while we try and get Sean back is we're going to play yeah. an interview with Derek Hines. Okay. Nice. Hinesy. Nice. <laughs> he lives in my hometown. Great Australian surfer <laughs> and um, surfed with an. Oh. Derek. Um, I believe you're on a trip down the coast. Um, welcome to the show. Oh, Good to have you. Thanks for having me, Mike. You're a good friend. And um, when I heard that uh, Sean was uh, the object of this uh, interview with a bit of PT thrown in, I was all over it because um, I guess I'm second generation pro surfer, uh, Sean and PT being first generation, along with the likes of his, uh, his great cohorts, Bugs. Dane, Terry Fitzgerald, Kanger, on and on and on. And I was fortunate enough uh, in the career sense of being a fly on the wall. <laughs> um, as these guys were still the celluloid heroes, to see them in the flesh surfing live events when pro surfing was so small. But, oh, boy, were they uh, – it, it was better than any event these days to have been on the fringe of the cutting edge when those guys uh, surfed anyway. I cut 50 years short, <laughs> I'm at, at present heading down the coast because it's been a really good run of surf of late. Uh, where I live in Byron Bay in Australia, that's the easternmost point. It, um, it's just come off having its best ever two year, two years of a perfect bank stretching um, longer than the best Capes of Francis you've ever seen. And um, unfortunately, uh, two floods came through and wrecked the bank. So now a lot of people are searching for surf. And, and just as a matter of interest, where exactly is, what is the name of this place you're going to, or is it a secret? Well, it's between Byron Bay and Crescent Head. And it's a, uh, it's a reef break that doesn't get affected by... Uh, the vagaries of floods. There isn't too much sand that gets swept in and out. 
So, yeah, I would have to come to JB and uh, give you a good talk yes. to if I was to reveal that. <laughs> well, well, I'll tell you why I'm asking you that question. I remember many years ago, you said to me one morning, you and I were having a cup of coffee at your place in JB, and you said to me, JB may not be the best point break in the world. In fact, it may not be the best point break in Africa. But you've never told me where the best point break is. And, well, and is it called the snake by any chance? No, no, no. But I would be uh, most surprised if JB hadn't uh, regained its mantle. With the way the wind drifts have shifted over the past 20 years since the early 1990s, um, you've got a lot of onshore flow on the uh, south coast and wild coast, uh, yes. which has disturbed those banks enormously, the ones that used to be the match, if not better than J-Bay, many times a year. Yeah, yeah, great stuff. And, and Derek, Tommy, now, memories of Sean Thompson? I mean, as you've mentioned or alluded to, certainly, I mean, he's, he's one of the greatest ever. I saw Sean at the Allen Oak Memorial Contest in 1977. Uh, he was on the Blue Railer, the, the Spider Blue Railer. And um, it was at a place called Woolamai on Phillip Island. And there was Sean Thompson in a six-man heat. And uh, I think I was paddling out for my next heat, just a, a rank rookie outsider. And Sean pulled into an impossible four-foot dumper with that wide-legged front foot. And it was just like... Uh, just like the movies, he just came out of that dump. I think they called it the doggy door years and years and years later. Yeah. But everyone just went, wow. Not even MP could do shit like that. Mm. And, and Derek, just as a point of reference, just give us some background as to, <clears throat> excuse me, as to when you started out. Um, you mentioned there that you were in this contest with Sean 77. Is that well, more or less when you started? Yeah, at the time, uh, in 76, I uh, went to Sydney University and was there until 78. But through holidays, I got to throw my hat in the ring elsewhere. Uh, in 76, my only real claim was the uh, InterVarsity champion. And uh, I repeated that in 78. Uh, it wasn't until 79 that I started uh, showing a bit of form, I guess. However, and, yeah, the yeah. Australian legs, they were open season in those days because the, uh, the stretch all the way down the east coast of Bells Beach was uh, fantastic as kind of a, uh, a flea pit for people like me to have a go at uh, making it. <laughs> and Derek, tell me, um, memories of Sean at Super Tubes, especially on big days and perfect days at Supers? Sean Thompson, Johnny Parman. Shut the gate. Those two guys. Well yep. Well I mean, said. shut the gate. I never got to see uh, Terry Fitz at his absolute peak, which was the year before I arrived when Huglin uh, shot Fantasy. Yes. But the way Sean could drive off his front foot. Uh, a lot of people wonder how it could have been done so perfectly by Sean. He had the weight, but the weight balancing front and dissuading balancing back to perfection like a rocking horse and i yeah. trace that back and i'm probably wrong so forgive me to the 1965 skateboard boom that hit durban <laughs> quite possibly well okay, we sean, lost sean but it's interesting sean, point sean um uh, forgive me sean but perhaps you were the uh most uh ugly longboarder i've ever seen on film but uh, you're also perhaps the best shortboarder I've ever seen on film. And that transition, I think, took place because of front foot, back foot on those bloody Surfer Sam skateboards from way, way back. Yeah, they didn't yeah. suit the longboard, but boy, they sh sure suited the shortboard. Yeah, we yeah, had dude, that skateboard. What sort of role would the high line at Supers have played you? I mean, is that something that you work out naturally? Um, I, I remember you often used to talk about taking the high line at supers and sean clearly did that very well um sean played no influence in that uh that was all terry fitzgerald and um with even more respect than for sean and pt is the respect i've got for uh, terry fitzgerald and jeff mccoy the two great yeah. shapers of the 1970s in australia 
And they were in a cold war against each other throughout the entire decade. One's um, surfboards were based on sticking to the face, pivot, getting barreled and staying there. The other was Highline flying on the wall with a giant edge at Sunset Beach and then fading and doing it all over again. So that's where I guess my mentor Terry said, uh, you know, why would you want to ride a wave easily by staying around the pocket when you could run at an edge along the high line and run run the risk of a really, really bad wipeout? But yeah. if making it, what a rush. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I, getting, I remember that. Sorry, but getting back to Sean. Um, Sean and, and JP, um, better than Simon Anderson at, uh, at, at, at Supers, uh, just because they radiated the high line, low line, as well as being in the pocket if they wanted it. Simon yeah. was the, the demolition maestro in and around the pocket. Yeah. But those two guys from, from such different back, backgrounds, one living in the dunes, the other at the beach hotel. <laughs> I thought you might hotel, bring this up. In those howling, 60 knot regular west winds where taking off at Boneyard meant sand blasting the eyeballs. Yeah. Uh, that is the, that's the quotient from back then compared to now. Getting sand blasted in the eyeballs never happens, mm -hmm. never happens, hasn't happened since the early 90s. Yeah. And, Man, and just digressing, you, you had to be on. You had to be able to drive off the bottom with the wind underneath your board, and then lift onto the high line, but know how to lean back off that high line into that wind, and then come back down to start it all over again. A completely different didn't, sport, different yeah, lifestyle platform. Didn't the Daytona 500 have something to do with that high line as well? Wasn't there yeah, something well, that's, not uh, dissimilar? That's the gig without fins, you know. Um, I, I was at yeah. the Daytona 500 in about 1999, 2000, and uh, I was following a, a green car that was number 66 because that was my address back then. And it was a, a shocking car. It was in the middle, but then there was a big crash, and somehow the restart, it got out front. So I was really focused half a mile away as it hit the speed bank. And I saw three cars up its ass, and at Daytona, that means... Uh, at 200 miles an hour on the speed bank. And I saw my green car lose it. It lost track <laughs> and it went sideways along the speed bank. And for, for about a second, maybe a second and a half, I saw it put a gap on the cars behind it before it went end over end in the most spectacular crash of the day. But in yeah. that in that time, I wondered if something like that could ever be done on the high line at J Bay. Yeah, yeah. Without fins. I mean, it could only be done without fins because you'd be yeah. sliding laterally across the face. But instead of having a really bad stack, you would be uh, recovering. <laughs> so, so, so is that essentially? Is that mind. essentially? Yeah, is that essentially what inspired you to get into finless surfing? Uh, yeah. Well, I never called it that because of Daytona 500. But that car lost all its friction. So yeah. it just became friction free. Yes. All friction yes. gone. You see it to an even greater extent with foil boarding. But I just don't know what to make of that sport. Yeah. And tell me, I, I take it you're still on finless boards there, Derek? No, no fins. No fins. It's been 16 years now. Yeah. Yeah. I must say, there's some fantastic um, clips on YouTube of you um, on your finless boards that I've, well, I happened to well, clip well, over bug, the weekend. Well, bugger the clips. I mean, it's, it's just fun. Yeah, yeah. Just speed. As Terry Fitzgerald used to say, speed thrills. You yeah, absolutely. It sure does. Yeah. And um, just digressing, the Gunston 500, you took part in a few of those, did you not? Yeah, quite a lot. Um, yep. uh, and historical anomaly is how the IPS rankings weren't filled with more South Africans particularly yes. the juniors. Yeah. The battle for the amateur Gunston was more intense than the battle for the Gunston 500. I mean, to, 
to fill those final places almost guaranteed you a spot on the Durban beachfront to serve out your army. <laughs> well said. I, I, I well wish said. I could laugh, but I'm not laughing. It was that yeah. intent. Yep. And that's where Burn got to surf that little shitty left running into the rock wall at the bay. Yeah. And, and he, what's he, the... Well, yes. so what, what sort of years are you talking about the now? Roger of uh, physical responsibility. Uh, he really wanted to win the amateur Gunston. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, all right, Derek, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up. Good. Any message here for Sean? Oh, uh, listen, I haven't spoken highly enough of Sean. Uh, Sean is. I just got a, a shiver. Sean is, if not one of five pioneers, arguably the pioneer. What Ernie did for Sean, I just got another shiver, in uh, yeah. in taking him early to Hawaii, in conditioning him into the art of uh, of tactics in the lineup, the, yeah. the way Sean uh, held his own against real Australian assholes in the water during the off <laughs> You want to name a few? <laughs> oh, well, you'll be in no, 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 no. In fact, someone said to me the other day, boy, now, and he's an ex-world champion, very well known, isn't so-and-so a nice guy? And yeah. this is one of uh, Sean's direct peers, an ex-world champion. And I said straight to his face, well, no, he's not a nice guy. We <laughs> never had to contend with him in the water when it was anything goes to get that wave. I mean, full, total respect. It was like yeah. a Bugs Bunny clip where, uh, where the uh, wolf and the uh, sheepdog check in in the morning before they go to work. And they're really yeah. not with each other. And then they're going to work, one being a wolf and one being a sheepdog, just wanting yeah. to murder each other. And then check out. Oh, how was your day, yeah. Ralph? Oh, good, Bill. How was you? Oh, not so um, bad. See you tomorrow. That's what the most um, was like. Scrapping for yeah. Penny. But... Um, yeah. I'm so privileged to just have met those guys. I couldn't sure. give a damn about what happened in the uh, actual competition arena. Just to have been around those foundation days and people within the uh, industrial side as well, mighty. And Sean, all power to the man. Yeah, well said. I'm, I'm glad to see you. nothing's changed. You, you, you're still not scared to mince your words. Oh, and, I was um, I was soft here. Very soft. <laughs> I've just had a little. I've just had a little message put in my hand to apologise to you for calling it finless surfboards. I should have called it friction free. So I do apologise. Peace, my brew. <laughs> Derek, it's always great to talk to you. And um, when are you coming to J Bay again? Uh, you know, I want to give the lineup chance to breathe after COVID and influx yeah, yeah. and. Uh, I don't want to tread on anyone's toes, so I'm more likely to turn up on summer than anything else. Yeah, well, please give me a shot. I'll give you the, the normal lift from the airport. And then just another thing that I've been wanting to ask you, whatever made you or drove you to paddle out immediately after the Mick Fanning shark incident? I study weather maps and surf reports. There was, sometimes at J-Bay, there's a one-wave swell. No, no, no. I'm talking one, about the shark that was obviously in the area. Next minute, you came paddling around the corner there. Well, come on. It was an hour later. Next minute. Bullshit. <laughs> but sometimes there's a one-wave swell. And I yeah. had pegged that towards the end of the the fatting uh, Julian uh, final, that's, that yeah. set was going to come. And it did. Yeah. And it so did, yes. When I paddled out, and note that it was on an 11-6 board. I recall. I... Um, I paddled way further out than where those guys were sitting, and the set Easy. came. Yeah, but I um, well, but uh, full credit goes to my host of the time, Merv Herskovitz, down at the bottom of Albatross. Oh uh, yes, yeah, you know, yeah. I wasn't even watching the final, and I suddenly heard because he was watching it on the internet, even though at Albatross he could stare straight up, and yes. I just heard him go, "Ooh, jeez." Like that. <laughs> and we just watched it unfold. And then he's a really classic Zimbabwean. And he yeah. turned and looked at me and went, Well, what do you reckon? And there was a pregnant pause. 
<laughs> and it's, it's just a classic case of him begging the response. Let's yeah. go. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, he went out of the point, and I paddled out from the bottom of the point, uh, the very bottom of the point. Um, and it might sound trite, but it wasn't meant to be. It was in homage to that poor long distance swimmer who got eaten about three years yes. ago. Yeah, and I remember I, that. I wanted to paddle straight over his grave and yeah. and uh, say a word of prayer for yeah, him well done. and for me. Yeah, no, well done. Derek, it's been fantastic talking to you again. Sure, I hope you have some great waves and a safe trip. Good yeah, to talk and to you, as always. Oh, Sean. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for being you, mate. See you. Thank you. <laughs> What a character, Sean. <laughs> that was, that was, he was an amazing surfer. Was, was, am, I, am I right in saying that your dad actually took him to hospital when he had his eye incident? Yeah, yeah, he did. Um, yeah, he lost the sight in one eye. He got, uh, his uh, leash came back and I think one of his swallowtails hit him in the eye. I actually saw it all happen. Um, he was in a heat against Mike Savage at the Bay of Plenty. Oh, very, very sad. But you know, he really bounced back incredibly, and you know, he had a uh, he didn't let it hold him back. The guy was amazing. You know, he had to surf with just sight and one eye. Incredible surfer, and and just an interesting, you know, very interesting uh, person. Very creative. Very offbeat. Very much on his own path. Very much so. I mean, to pull up on the side of the road in his motor car. And conduct him or give his little interviews. Oh, it's great. Nice. Sums up Derek. He was sitting in his motor car. <laughs> Sean, you've been very generous with your time. We're nearly done. We, we would just like to talk a little bit about busting down the door, if you don't mind. And um, I'm sure Sandy has some questions for you as well. But I've watched that movie also, a number of times. And I beg your pardon? I'll tell you also, I'd like to, um, I'd like to also you know, mention my new book. Which is going We're going to, to talk about that, if you don't I mind. I just, just wanted to make sure because it's, it's you know, it's, it's one of my new creative projects, and I think it's going to help a lot of a lot of people. But busting down the door—that was a, it, 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 I really enjoyed that project. It's a fantastic movie, but you know, when you look at it, there, there are quite a few things that intrigue me, and the movie almost tends to suggest that the Hawaiian surfers were on your side. Would that be right? I had an, I had an amazing respect uh, from the Hawaiians. I think for two reasons. One is that I loved Hawaiian the culture, and that came from my father. When my father was recuperating from arm surgery after his shark attack, he'd gone to San Francisco for arm surgery, and then recuperated in Hawaii and met the Kahanamoku family, and and I think had this lifelong love for Hawaii that he transferred to his children. So we always loved Hawaii. Then he brought uh, Eddie Aikawa to compete in the Gunston 500 in 1972. And I remember at the time during apartheid, they wouldn't allow Eddie to stay in the hotel that had been booked for him, the Malibu Hotel on the beachfront in Durban. So Eddie came and stayed with us. Um, and I used to take Eddie That's surfing different. every morning. And I think he never forgot that. And Eddie was this iconic figure. and. Uh, you know, when we went to Hawaii when we were young boys, my cousin Michael and I, you know, Eddie would invite us over and have a party for us at his at his house. So I think there was this wonderful warmth between um, between South Africans, us and, and, and Eddie. And and I think, you know, sure we did get in we did get uh, got on the wrong side of some gangsters in Hawaii and I remember I had to go and buy a twelve gauge shotgun because I had so many death threats. But it, was, it, it wasn't like the Hawaiian community. It was just this community of, of gangsters. And my situation occurred because this journalist had written about them. Uh, and um, they, for some reason, it was like false news that I had actually written this article because he mentioned, this journalist mentioned this, this gang in the article. So eventually the situation was resolved, but it was, it was pretty scary. But in busting down the door, we really covered this one incident that, that Rabbit pretty much had and Ian Cairns had. 
with Hawaiians when Hawaiians perceived that they had been disrespected um, because, uh, you know, surfing was their sport and, 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 and in many ways that their lifestyle because it originated in Polynesia and perhaps there was a perception of disrespect when nothing was was further from the truth. And I think once we, we sort of detail this court case in the movie, once I think everyone had 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 their say and explained themselves, they could see that there was no disrespect. And I think things got got back to normal. But it was a couple of tense months. <laughs> Sean, sorry, can, can you see us? Yes. Okay, yeah, Gary thought we had lost you for a moment. Okay, we're going to play a little trailer on busting down the door, and then um, we're going to get into uh, the surfer and the sage. You cool with that? On the island of Oahu, Hawaii, was emerging as the center of the surfing universe. Surfing reflected sort of a counterculture idea. The image that came out of the Summer of Love era was that surfers were uh, really druggies. Then this new group came along and said, no, no, we're not going to do that at all. In fact, we want to make surfing into a sport. And everyone turned around and just went, they want to do what? There was no such thing as pro surfers, because you couldn't make a living from pro surfing. You had this irrational group of kids, and they walked into this town just going, hey, we've got some new moves, we've got some new boards, we've got some new attitude. Hawaii it was a two-fold mission. It was one, I wanted to rip it, and two, I wanted to get famous. Sean, um, sadly, sadly, Petey has bailed. He, he said he had a link problem, um, uh, which we just got from him a moment ago or a little while ago. So, unfortunately, he's not going to be with us. Petey's a very busy guy. Yeah, I'm sure he is, but yeah, thank you for your time. Now, Sandy, do you want to um, perhaps kick off um, with Sean and the Surfer and the Sage? Yeah, so your first book um, is amazing. I've got a signed copy. I'm very lucky. Tell us about your second book and how it happened. Yeah, so my first book were, was called Surface Code. Um, and Surface Code came as a result of this code that I created for these uh, young kids at, at Rincon. And then um, after I uh, came out of the book, I was just at a local school here, a very small school of 80 kids. And I, I, I said to the kids, you know, I was talking about my book the headmaster had paddled up to me when I was surfing and said, you want to come down and talk to the kids about surface code? So I was chatting to the kids uh, and I said, surface code's my code. I wrote it 12 lines. Every line begins with, I will, 105 words. Why don't you write your own codes, 12 lines? Uh -huh. um, and they wrote their codes and the very first line of code I got back. So this was about six months, or eight months after I'd lost Matthew. The very first line I got back from a young girl was, I will be myself. So I just thought, wow, that is such a powerful, incredible oh my gosh. line. And it's so potent that immediately I got inspired to write another book. So I wrote my second book called The Code. Um, and it became, it became really popular. And I use that as a structure now to motivate positive decision making and help people find and activate purpose. Um, and then during COVID, so my, uh, my career had shifted into uh, keynote speaking and leadership uh, workshops for large corporations. So when COVID happened, I was in Chicago. There was, I had three events and I did my first event and then had to cancel the next two on the day because of COVID. And I came back to my wife and I said, hey, my business is finished. It's done. I don't know how long COVID's going to go on, but no one is going to be wanting to, to be in a group of people. I've got to do something different. I've got to change. I've got to make, I've got to make a dramatic change. What am I going to do? And I'm going, but I know businesses are still going to want to empower and inspire their teams. So let me see if I can do it virtually. So I found a studio downtown here in Santa Barbara and a team. And I, I went, I'm going to create the first virtual keynotes and workshops, because no one was doing it. Everyone was doing these funky things on Zoom. So uh, I found the technology, I found the people, and my very first, I pitched it out to my, my client. My very, my very first client 
was the hottest company in the world at that time. They were the only company in the whole world that had a treatment for COVID. It was called Gilead Sciences. It was the, it was on the, they were on the front page of every single newspaper and, you know, their teams were under incredible stress and pressure. So they needed inspiration, upliftment, empowerment, and connectivity. So I created programs for them and did a few events for them. And then I started doing all these events for like amazing companies, virtually, virtually from the studio downtown. Amazing, huh? So what I did is I, I thought, how are these people feeling about COVID, about, about the stresses of COVID? How are they feeling? So I, I found this technology and I got people to send me texts. Right at the beginning of my presentation, I go, send me one word. What, right now? Like in the audience? Send me a word, yeah. Send me a word right now. Text it to me. How are you feeling? And the words, they would text me a word. They had this cool technology and it would come up on the screen. So someone... Okay. Someone in, in, in Sydney, Australia, and someone in, in, in Seoul, North Korea, could send me where they'd arrive at the same time and they, they'd populate the screen. And, and I created this word cloud concept. So the, the more frequent words, the more popular words were bigger. So if I had 1,000 a, a or 2,000 people on, I'd get 2,000 texts but they'd all come up on one screen and the common words were bigger. That's so wonderful. Could, so you can visually see it. Yeah. So I could see, I could, at a glance, I could see how people were feeling. And this is wow. in all sorts of different groups. So I would do it with PTSD survivors. I do it with rehab clinics. I do it with massive companies like, like Gilead. Um, so you know the four words were? No. Stress, anxiety, depression, disconnection. Those were the four. I called it a sad mindset. So when I met Noah, Noah my co-author, and, and he said to me, hey, Sean, let's write a book. We just met. After five minutes, he said, Sean, let's write a book just together. Just me. We were having lunch. And I went, right on. We're going to call it The Surfer and the Sage. He said, a night to survive and ride life's waves. We, we had worked out the concept of the book, the, the concept, um, in about five minutes. But then it came time now, well, how, like, what are going to be the specifics of what we're going to write about? So I said to, I said to Noah, Noah is a, uh, a scholar of theology. Um, he studied... Uh, the, both uh, the New and Old Testament plus the Torah and also the Talmud and the Kabbalah it's like the mystic aspect of Judaism but he's a very learned guy Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize which is a very big literary, literary prize in the United States Pulitzer nominated and he's written millions of books so I said well how many chapters should we have what's a, a number that has a religious significance that has a spiritual significance so he said to me, every letter in the Hebrew alphabet has a numerical equivalent. So he said, let's do 18. I said, why 18? He said, well, 18 is chai. It's a Hebrew word. And it means life. Yeah. It means life. So I said, okay, well, that, that's great, 18. So, that's it. so, we wrote, so, so now we, we've got 18 chapters. But now I've seen how people are feeling, the sad mindset, stress, anxiety, Depression, this kind of, I'm going, well, let's write a book that can help, help with this. It can be like a, like a bridge. It can be like a Swiss army knife to change your mindset. Beautiful. So, so the way we structure the book, it's got 18 chapters. And every chapter is about a duality in life. It's not about the good or the bad. It's about the good and the bad. And every chapter starts like the very first chapter, anxious and calm. Oh, wow. Fear and hope. So the book is a, a little guide to help you go from despair to hope, from anxiety to calmness. That's a fantastic, that's a fantastic model. That's yeah, a fantastic so, structure. So that's the way we, that's the way we did it. So you ask how, 
how it's created. Surface Code started out with the little card I did for the kids. The how, did you meet, card, how did you meet Noah? I just met him. Our friends introduced us. We just had lunch. We, we never oh, even wow. knew each other. Five minutes. Five That's minutes. amazing. And, and um, yeah, it, it's like you never know how life can work. But, like, I try to stay stoked and I try to get involved with cool projects and I try to, I try to always, like, just do stuff. It's, it's very... Uh, so, you know, so given what you're doing is so incredibly um, empowering for, as you say, even if it's just one person in the audience, although I'm 100% sure it isn't, but even if it's just changing that perception for that one person, what do you think yeah. would be the greatest miracle we need in the world right now? You know what I want? I do want to know. So, my code is everyone's code. My code is open source code. I want every person on this planet writing their code, 12 lines, every line beginning with our will. I want every single person on this planet writing that 12 lines, every line beginning with our will, and you write it in 15 minutes and you share it. And I'm creating this process right now. It's going to be ready next week. You can go on my website. You can I post will. the code. You can create your own tribe. Sandy Coffee can create her own tribe, the coffee tribe. Or you can create, if you work for Unilever, you can create and you work in the operations department, you can create the Unilever operations tribe. And in that tribe, everyone can post up their codes. And it's confidential. Only that team can create the code. So when you write the code, you're activating purpose, you're activating positivity, you're activating power. And I want to create this wave, this wave that sweeps around the planet, empowering everyone, uniting everyone. Because when people read their codes and write their codes and speak their codes and see everyone else's codes, they realize that while every code is different, we only write two lines of code. And our fundamental purpose in life can be defined by two lines of code that every single person writes. They write, I will be better. We all want to be better. We want to be better today than we were yesterday. We want to be better tomorrow than we are today. We want to be better. But that's only half of our life purpose. The other half of our life purpose is people write this in their own way. I will help others be better. I will be a so mentor. You, so it comes down to that. It comes down to those two lines. I will be a mentor. I will be a leader. I will lift others up when they're down. I will volunteer. I will donate. I will devote my life to serve. And we all realize that we're the same and we're connected. In the United States, there's so much disunity. You have Republicans, yeah. Democrats. You have a big valley between it. I'll tell you what, the code, it's like a bridge. Totally, because everyone's the same underneath. Pardon? Everyone wants the same thing, actually, yeah. ultimately. You want to so, get from the one what side. What so is you your code? From the one, so you want to get from the one side of the valley to the other side? Man, you ride that wave. And the code's like riding a wave. I love it. And how did you get to the title of the book? Was that easy? It just sprung into my mind. When Noah said to me, let's write a book together, I thought immediately, the surfer and the sage. It's oh, the two of you. Exactly. exactly. It's the two of you. Then he said to me immediately, when I said that to him, he looked over me and went like that. A guide to survive and ride life's waves. That was it. That's how um, you know people you can you can like think and think and, and like and then suddenly kaboom it can happen. Yeah, so for anyone that's listening that that that, that, that wants to um, get the book. Oh you can get the book, yeah, Pan Macmillan. It'll be it'll be out in SA. I think it's launching in about uh, sometime in September. Are you but, coming out for launch, by the way? I'm um, actually I'm gonna be in SA for like just five days in um, in uh, in mid-August, but I want to come out perhaps a later time for the launch. 
Um, I'm looking for like a you know corporate sponsor. I'd love to do a tour. Like when I did the code, I did a tour of schools in SA, the from the poor schools to the posh schools. You know, the Hilton Michael houses of the world. Plus, I also did super poor schools in Kaplahong and in Nanda, Ochlanga School. I did this amazing school when Nelson Mandela voted for democracy in 1994. I went to Ochlanga School. It was amazing. Amazing. I went to Kulika School where a young a young guy is the principal. 1600 students and I helped them through school and helped them through university and it was amazing to see this this young guy so I would love to be able to you know to do another tour because because kids just oh my god they love they love the code I just got an email I got an email uh, yesterday from an English teacher in a work of beach Australia said hey Sean I saw I saw an interview with you, and I did the code with my um, I did the code with my students, and uh, I went, "How cool is that?" He said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. see, uh, you, you must see what they they wrote." So it's so wonderful to see that um, this code is open source code, and anyone that wants to use it can use it in any way they want. So, so this guy sent me this amazing stuff from uh, from. Uh, you know, his students, and it's just wonderful to see this, um, to see this connectivity that uh, that students can have and how, how they, they take the code and the code becomes their own. Like, this is what the students wrote. I mean, I got this yesterday. I will go to bed with a smile on my face. Oh, I will take man. risks, but never do the wrong thing. I'll make someone laugh each day. And I create this poster for them. And it goes up on the wall of the classroom. So every day, one line from each kid, they can walk past it and I will strive to be a, a better listener. I will stay true to who I am. I will never give up on what I love. I'll learn the moment. I mean, it's like... Is it, did you say 12? One, this project... 12. 12, you've got to yeah. But these, and what, then on what's the post, the it goes, what, um, I don't know. I have no idea why it came out at 12. It just came out at 12. When I was writing it for the kids, it just, I think it just came out. You know, it was like when I came to the last line, I will honor the sport of kings. You know, and, and that last line's a metaphor, yeah. obviously, for oh, yeah. integrity, respect. Yeah. I was just like, I was finished. <laughs> So has has um, Luke written his own code? Yeah, Luke wrote his code. Luke wrote his code. Carla wrote his code, and it's a wonderful thing to do with family. So on Monday, my website, the website will be ready on Monday. Go, I'm encouraging people if you're listening, go on the go on and and create your own tribe. Maybe it's your family. Okay. Maybe it's your business. Maybe it's, maybe it's just you yourself. Um, I mean, all of you. You can, you can write your code. And if, anyone, and, if anyone listening can sponsor Sean to do his around South Africa school tour, um, you can just go onto the website and get hold of him. I mean, you know, we've got to put it out there, Sean. Oh, yeah, no, that'll be, that, that, that'd be fun. I mean, I love, I love, I love, I love, um, so, so I love coming back to South Africa. So, you know, there's something about South Africans. So when you think about it, so you have the richest guy in the world now, a South African dude from Pretoria, from Pretoria, uh, no. Elon Musk. Yeah. You have like one of the most incredibly famous um, actresses. Um, then you have like one of the greatest, Nelson Mandela, one of the greatest leaders of all time. You know, we're talking about a small, we're talking about a small country. But you know what I've come to understand about South Africa and this whole concept of like, Burmaka plan and South Africans just oh, go. Yeah. Yeah. South Africa, let me tell you, South Africa, motivation nation. Totally. That's we've survived. Nation. That's South Africa. Yeah. So motivation. when you come back to South Africa, you can come down to St. Francis and stay. You know, we've got a, you know, we've got a place for you there. And we've got right next to Hewlett's, right next to oh. uh, uh, just a short ride to Cape St. Francis. 
<laughs> short ride to J Bay. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 oh, yeah, I'm, very I'm, short ride to J Bay. Fast ride when the waves are cooking. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to. Uh, I'm looking forward to coming back to the to the homeland. Sean, I, I'm finished with my part of it. I really, I know that I asked you some very personal questions, and thank you for for honouring me with those answers. I know it's difficult to go there sometimes, but I think that it's important to share, and uh, I really, really honour and value your answers. Thank you. No, 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 no. With pleasure. With pleasure. Well done, Sandy. Sean, we I know this has been a long time, but we would like to maybe ask you if we could just end off with a little bit on pipeline. We're going to play you a quick video. It's probably a 20 seconds, if that. And then just ask you one or two questions about the dangers of pipeline. Sure. Well, I've always thought that pipeline is the most important wave in the world. I think it's one of the most technically challenging waves in the world. I think it's a wave that is really a measure of surface courage. Also of his technical ability. And also it's a measure of, of his instinct. Because it's a very instinctive way. It's very compressed. It's compressed into ultra steep takeoff, jam into the barrel and out. There's the pink banana again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sean, some of your um, hairy moments there? Or some of your more hairy moments? Yeah, you know, when you see these amazing surfers today arrive pipeline, you know, John John Florence and Kelly, and um, it's like, it's it's mind-blowing the chances that they take. But, you know, boards today are so much shorter, so guys are taking off so much later, and they're just managing to, to stick it in the face, almost like uh, uh, the, the first guys that did that with the boogie board is this famous Hawaiian boogie board, a guy called Mark Stewart, who was really a revolutionary, even though he was on a boogie board, about how, a pipeline can be written, but it was always a very, uh, it's a very intimidating wave. You can stand on the beach at pipeline and you can feel that concussion uh, almost through your feet because it breaks very close. It's only 25 to 50 meters out. It's right there. It's almost like a, a, a I mean, it's, it, it's right near shore. So what's scary about it is, is the wave comes up out of very deep water and it hits the shallow coral reef, stands straight up, and then you've got a very hard offshore wind northeast trade wind so often you know pipeline and then there's a massive pack of people now it wasn't crowded back in my day but today you know you've got a big crowd to contend with yeah. so the big thing at pipeline is you've got to commit man you've got to commit to that drop and i write on the surface code i will take the drop with commitment so you I will paddle for that wave you've got to paddle over the edge it's almost like you've got to break through this fear barrier and then you just got to absolutely commit to the drop no hesitation uh, you have to be absolutely unequivocal in your focus and your desire and your um, power to just paddle over that edge. Um, and then it's the, you know, it's the big tube ride. Um, yeah. Today, it's not so much, you don't really see maneuvers that much at Papa, and it's just how can we take off as deep as possible um, and, and, and make it out. And the danger is there because you've, you, you're surfing over a very shallow coral reef, and pipeline, no matter how good the guys are, and even though they've got leg ribs, they still die out there. You know, there's this incredibly fast current that sweeps along right by the beach. It's most probably a, you know, five or six knot current. So if you get caught in the white water there and you get knocked out, the guys just can't get to you in time. Even though yeah. there's lifeguards there with jet skis, people still die there. I think, I think 18 people have died at the pipeline. Um, and in fact, the last wave that I rode at the Banzai Pipeline. It was an exhibition heat a few years ago, uh, right before the final, they had some past champions. They said, oh, you go out there. So it was about eight to 10 feet radical. And I pulled into this big back door. Back door is the right hand breaking way. But I pulled right into it and I was right back in the tube. And I thought, man, it's like the 70s. I'm going to come blasting out. And next thing I'm lying on the reef, smashed on the reef, and my board comes over and it hits me in the nose so hard that I just saw stars, broke my nose, exploded my nose. Jesus. And I came up I'm bleeding. And I remember half stunned and there was still a few minutes left in the heat, you know? So I get, I get washed in and I walk up and there's thousands of spectators on the beach. And I walk up to a spectator to go, you know, how's my nose? And I walked up to show him, the guy just ran away. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 But now I've got a few minutes left. I paddled out. And as yeah. I paddled out, the other guys in the water, this famous Hawaiian, Dane Killer, he goes, hey, Sean, you better go in right now. I, I said, I said, why? Does it look really bad? He said, no, you're going to attract sharks. There's too much blood. <laughs> <laughs> so they just, they just glued my nose up right there on the beach with super glue. They're, they're dark on the beach. I said, is this medicinal food? He said, no, I bought it at the hardware store. He showed me for $1.89. <laughs> so, that's the last wave I've ever and will ever ride at the Bamsan Papa. It's, it's a place for, I think you've got to be young. You've got to be fast. Uh, although I did but, see an amazing wave from one of my contemporaries there, this guy, Michael, her last winter. But Papa's off the list now, off the list. Yeah, although... Not so long ago, he had that fantastic wave at Backdoor. I think it was around about December, January. I think at the age of 60 on. Yeah. yeah. Sean, I must tell you, you've been a fantastic um, host and a um, oh, fantastic guest, I beg your pardon. I'm a little bit distracted. What, should, what, what would you like me to tell Spidey? Hold on a sec. We're also trying to drag it up because Mali, Malikis is coming back shortly um, from Dahlstrom. Um, but just briefly, you want to touch on um, the relaunch of Instinct? Yeah, so I'm working with a, with, with, with a, a crew in Durban, which is going to be really excited. That's where the brand, that's where the brand uh, developed. Um, and I called it Instinct originally uh, because the best moments in surfing for me were riding inside the tube. And the best tubes happened when you're riding on Instinct. Uh, so it, it had a very pure beginning. We used this wonderful logo that, I've, that, that, that a guy called Derek Berry designed off a picture of this guy, Mike Duff, the South African photographer, had taken to be my first water shot ever. And my dad had me, before Instinct started, he had me use this big logo uh, on my board. I said, oh, no, Dad, I'm too embarrassed. It's too big. He said, listen, this is the deal. You're going to have the logo on the boards or else you're going to pay for the boards. <laughs> 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 so you know, my dad was a great, was a great marketing guy. So that became the logo uh, for Instinct. So we started, we started in Durban, and now we're going to restart uh, Durban. So we want to start off small, uh, hardcore. You know, all the all the big companies now are owned by these massive conglomerates, and uh, you know we're going to have some some cool, simple product that really reflects. Uh, the core essence of, of, of instinct, you know, surfing is life, the rest yeah. is the girls. Um, so so you know, manufactured in South Africa, but sold offshore as well? Uh, at this stage, we, 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 we did a soft launch. Well, we did a launch in Australia a, a number of months ago, and it's been going quite nicely down there. So it's oh, just good. small grassroots core, and I'm just hoping that, you know, the, the young crew, young surfers, guys and girls, um, you know, get get attracted to the to the purity of it, the in interesting uh, interesting product. Yeah. Oh, well, best of luck. I hope it goes well. Just before you go, your mate has come back. He'd like to say hello to you. He's been in Dahlstrom. I mean, <laughs> hey, sure. You know the water, my bro. I'll be rushing back. I'm flying all the way over the world yet to get to you. <laughs> I want my jacket. I want my jacket with the pineapples on it. <laughs> oh man, but I, I tell you, I, I don't know where the vinyl jacket is. Oh, oh, the thing. Oh, uh, but I, I, I believe we've got a, 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 a special guest as well. Kevin, is that right, Kevin? Yeah? Oh, okay, so Spider, Spider was on already. Yeah, yes. Ah, Spider. Spider. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lovely man. Uh, it was a, a couple of pictures. And I think, I think we've just. Oh, there we go. I got it. I think um, Gary just wanted to bring out a few comments because we've had a whole lot of love. We've had a whole lot of love coming through. I was watching on the uh, on the YouTube link, and it's been uh, it's been marvelous. Uh, uh, there we go. There's Spider. Is that one of your longboards there? I love that. <laughs> oh man. And um. And uh, Sean, I think it's just a, a couple of comments. You want to come on here as, as well, Mike? I'll, yeah, I'll give you a... Yeah, sorry, I'll you your jacket. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I see Kenny Barwood's on there, so cool, J, J Bay Surf. And, uh, okay, we, uh, there's lots of love coming on here, Sean. Plenty. Uh, and, uh, Davina. 
Davina there from Sydney. I see uh, Mike Grady here after 40 years Very as well. Very I think he moved to the States. Um, How are you doing, Barry? <laughs> Excellent, man. Uh, Marinda Ferreira, good evening as well. Uh, and Kathy Marsh, oh, she, she's got the, her hair back stuff. again, I see. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Garth Webster. Uh, Big G. Local here in, in PE as well. Uh, as, as to watch the, the Gunston 500, of course, I heard you Gavin, talking about it earlier. Incredible. I forgot to mention Gavin, what an amazing surfer he was. Incredible, one of the greatest. Yeah, 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 yeah for, for sure. Um, I, I see uh, Barry Brooklyn saying Sean Paul coming to uh, SA next July. Is that right? Excellent. Uh, August, brilliant. Uh, so I'm not meeting him. Okay, brilliant. Oh, Jeff Isico, my, my, my good mate here, who's raised tens of millions of dollars for challenged athletes. Just an incredible, uh, oh, man. incredible work for the community. Still very <laughs> brilliant, 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 brilliant. <laughs> very brilliant. Yeah, still, still very prachtig for you. There we go. Uh, absolute legend and greatest of all time. There we go. Gunston 500. Oh, okay. <laughs> Keith Clark. Yeah. Keith Clark's in, uh, in the house. Yeah, he's, he, he's, he supplies us with some gin and pun punches and stuff every now and again. <laughs> hello, Nuck. <laughs> and there we go. Spyball saying hello. Stuart Portkitt, yeah, all, all the way from USA as well. They're watching from all over the world. Oh, they love you, there Dean. Dean Allen. Dean Allen's our, our historian. He's, he's over in, uh, in Slovakia at the moment. So we've got, we've got people. I love, <laughs> not this much culture. I love the lighthouse feature. Oh, there we go. Yes, yes, very nice. Uh, Barbara Manners, or oh, oh, she's she, Barbara knows everybody in this in this town as well. She's uh, been a sunrise. Thank you so much, Barbara. Anthony, all the way from Cape Town. I know Anthony's from Cape Town, and uh, biggest salutes to you as well. There we go. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah, no, this is very cool. Man. It's very nice. And very nice of you guys to do this. Thank you. It's a pleasure, pleasure. And, and, and thank you so much for coming on, Sean. It's, it's been absolutely wonderful. Um, I thank mean, you. I, I've, I've been watching, I've been picking up Stompies the whole way through, you know, I've, I've been on the plane, so we get little bits and pieces here and there. <laughs> Sean, and, uh, thank you very much for your time. It's really been great catching up with you and um, hopefully we can catch no, up no, with no, you in no, August. But we, we want to try and do the auction on that board or try and do something along those lines. And then um, if we get the right number, we donate the balance to your charity or charity of your choice. Great, you know, there's, there's, there's We'll two, discuss that with Spider. Yeah, there's two great 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 charities uh, uh there's oh, nine mile foundation down in cape town and surface not street for children up in durban so so those are the, those are two charities i love both of them just okay. do incredible work using okay well, we'll 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 make sure that we get the get the money to those ones we'll, we'll get in we'll pe keep in touch with you and we'll find the right spot to to do it uh and and speak to spider i, I did an auction at the uh, at the at the bill at the was was bill of program the corona the corona pro and I think they raised like 220,000 rand or something there for, for, for a charity too. So if we get the surfers drunk enough, then we'll be able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a oh, sure. Yeah, um, but uh, Sean, I know, I, know um, um, I can't hear you on this, on this particular one. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah I can lip read. Okay, I can lip read. But um, thank you so much, Sean, for coming thank on. Thank you, Sean. Um, I don't know if we're going to give the, do uh, the no, okay, go. All right. So, so um, and and I, and I know next Tuesday we've got we got a show again. It's, it's Ari Croc next Tuesday. We, we keep in with the surfer theme. Right. Sharon son Ari. And uh, and we, we and we're doing it. Um, but thank you, and, and uh, I'm thank sure you. I'm sure you want you want to say been, it's been an absolute pleasure. Really, yeah. thank you very much, Sean. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Being with you, Spider. thank you very much, Spider, for coming yes, out as well. And Spider, if you don't mind, I'll contact you about that board. We'll put feelers okay. out. We've got a couple of names there, okay. And then right. I'll discuss it with you if you don't mind. But thank you very much for your time and your patience, and thank for the wonderful you. stories. And thank you, Sandy. And Sandy, you. Sandy, thank Sandy you. Coffee coming and on as well. Um, so that, um, love to Carla. Love to Carla. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Thanks, All the best. Sure.